Sabko namaskar and uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, I, on behalf of the Department of Philosophy and Religion, welcome each and everyone to this uh, second day morning session. And Uh, let me quote just one quotation from the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 8, verse 10, which says, um, which says that knowledge, knowledge is even better than finest and purest goal. So we all are in uh, pursuit of knowledge, and I hope we all will have a fruitful, uh, a fruitful day today. And yes, as we start... Uh, time is also uh, passing very fast, and we have many series of sessions after this. So may I uh, request all our speakers to kindly come forward. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Kumar Shukla, and then to kindly come forward and take your seat. And then secondly, Dr. Subra Joyeti Das, and thirdly, Dr. Rajesh Chaurasia and Dr. Uh, Rajiv Lochan Behera. If you can kindly come forward and take your seat, we'll be glad. We have all this. Uh, yeah. And uh, this session will be uh, <clears throat> presided over by our respected professor, S.P. Pandey. So, sir, may I request you to kindly take the seat and as well as to offer the tribute to our founder, Respected uh, Madame Malbiaka uh, portrait. Me. Uh, may I request uh, Sir uh, S.P. Pandey to kindly come over and preside the uh, session? Yes, sir. Please, uh, please proceed. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We are on the dais and. Uh, the learned philosophers who have come from all parts of India and even abroad. As for the tradition of Banaras University, first of all, I will request Dr. Sanjay Ji, Sanjay Shukla Ji, for guiding to Malia Ji portrait. Please come. Can we fix? Uh, yes, uh, we would like to felicitate our respected uh, speakers for this session. Um, may I request uh, Sir S.P. Pandey to... Um, To uh, to felicitate <laughs> the doctor. Okay. 
Yes, that's Dr. Razis Orishia. Yes. And next, uh, Dr. Dr. Samzai Kumar Shukla. And Dr. Shubha Jyoti Das. And Dr. Raziva Lochan Behera. And I request, uh, and I request our head of uh, our department, Professor Anand Mishra, to kindly come over and felicitate our uh, chairperson, Professor SP SP Pande. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I think we will proceed. Yeah, sure. Yes. Sure. Yes, yes. Uh, and so we just have uh, one hour and 15 minutes for this session. So each speakers will be given, um, though you come from very far off place, <laughs> we would like to request you that we will be giving 15 minutes each to each speaker. We just have uh, one hour and 15 minutes for the whole session. So 15 minutes for each speaker and then uh, the next 15 minutes will be uh, used for question and hour together after all the papers have been presented um, and now we will be having dr sanjay kumar uh, shukla he is uh, uh, at present in philosophy department ewing christian college uh Riyagaraj. Uh, he has uh, he, his specialization is on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant and Husserl's phenomenology. He has written ten books uh, like modernity and postmodernity debates, related issues and challenges, Kant's um, Copernican revolutionary revolution in the philosophy of uh, Edmund Husserl, Indian philosophies, uh, philosophers of the recent past. Hindi translation of Khan, uh, Khan's Perpetual Peace as uh, Shewat Shanti and uh, others. Uh, he has also contributed in Encyclopedia of Hinduism and he has to his uh, credit more than a dozen series uh, research papers in the leading journals of philosophy okay may i request sir sunday to kindly come over and deliver the lecture good morning everybody Respected chairperson, distinguished scholars of philosophy present in this hall. Before I speak something about my research paper, first of all, I would like to congratulate my friend, Professor Anand Mishraji for conducting wonderful seminar on the post-independent philosophers, post-independent Advaitic thinkers, sorry, post-independent Advaitic thinkers. You see, for the last 16 months, I couldn't have 
my personal studies because I have met retinal detachment of my left eye and doctor advised me not to study. So in that situation, after 16 months, I got an opportunity to start my studies. So the entire credit goes to this seminar in general and Professor Anand Mishra in particular. So from this perspective, this seminar is wonderful for me to begin with my studies. And this uh, seminar is wonderful from another perspective. What is that perspective? At present, my mind is contemplating about Indian understanding of Kant. Indian understanding of Kant. So this seminar is going to be part and parcel of my thinking process. Indian understanding of Kant. And in that connection, I have written philosophical ideas of uh, Professor A.C. Mukherjee, Professor T.R.V. Murthy ji. I was studying K.C. Bhattacharya last year. In the August, I met a retinal detachment of my left eye. So I will continue with that. And in that connection, I am now in position to include our great teacher, Professor Shiv Shankar Roy, who has written a very lucid, very lucid, faith and given a very faithful lucid as well as faithful exposition of Advaita Vedanta. Most of most of us must have studied the heritage of Shankar. The heritage of Shankar written by Professor S. S. Roy in the year 1965. And uh, at that time, Professor Roy was reader in this department. He was reader in this department. And from here, he has gone to Allahabad University, back to the Allahabad University. So with this brief note, and uh, President Sir, whenever you want, I should close. You just give me two minutes time, two minutes warning, and I will just wind up. The title of my research paper is an Advaitic appraisal of Kant's criticism of metaphysics, right? And uh, this research paper, for the sake of convenience, has been divided under three distinct sections, right? Your first section delineates Kantian position regarding metaphysics, what Kant has to say about metaphysics. And uh, in the second section, I have given a comparative account of uh, Kant on the one hand and Advaita Vedan on the other hand vis-a-vis -vis metaphysics, naturally. Are you talking only about metaphysics? And uh, the third and the last section of my research paper is devoted to Advaitic reformulation of Kantian metaphysics. Right? So, you see, <coughs> Immanuel Kant is a metaphysician par excellence. But the arguments which he has offered have turned out to be anti-metaphysical. It has turned out to be anti-metaphysical. We all know the famous book of Kant that is Pralagama to any future metaphysics. And in that particular book, 
he has made the distinction between metaphysical propositions and non metaphysical propositions. Okay. How he has made this distinction? First of all, under your non metaphysical proposition, we are going to have a proposition of natural or empirical sciences and of uh, mathematics. There is some similarity between your mathematics and metaphysics. Both are a priori in nature, but still there is a difference between your math mathematics and your metaphysics. What can be the ground for making distinction between mathem mathematical propositions and your uh, metaphysical propositions? You see, your math mathematical propositions are to be grounded in intuition, whereas, whereas, whereas your metaphysical proposition is trans empirical right uh, it is not grounded in intuition then what is going to be the source of uh, your metaphysical proposition the answer is very simple for kant the source of metaphysical proposition is to be reason only not understanding no now comes the problem on the one hand you are accepting metaphysical proposition you are accepting metaphysical cognition but at the same time how you will clarify that uh, how you will clarify that uh, they are going to provide us knowledge or they are cognitions. In Kantian philosophy, there are two criteria. Any proposition can be significant proposition or it will provide you knowledge only if it is intelligible, one thing, and secondly, capable of being proved or disproved. Either either you can prove or disprove it then it, is then it is a significant proposition and your intelligibility so can metaphysical propositions fulfill these two conditions the conditions of intelligibility and the condition of of proof or disproof and if it is not satisfying these two conditions, then your metaphysical proposition turns out to be nonsensical. Yeah. So, you see, it is curious to note that what Kant seems to, what Kant seems to give by defining metaphysical cognition he withdraws when he comes to assess the value of such cognition under two aspects of meaning and proof and then again there's a problem with Kant the how 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 to put it under any category because we all know the scope of categories, categories of understanding is limited, right? It is limited to phenomena. It cannot go beyond that. But he has to explain. Then he has given one category. Do you know the category of totality? So he has just tried to put unconditional or nominal entities under the categories of totality. It's funny. Why it is funny? Because if you are putting the unconditioned under the category of totality, then that means 
that either it is not a category at all or the unconditioned reality is not unconditioned. So, actually, you see, whenever Whenever the attempt is made by Indian scholar to rectify Kantian philosophical position, whenever I am making a very loud, loud claim, whenever any Indian scholar tries to rectify Kantian philosophy, so Your agnostic position of Khan is very difficult to digest. At least, at least in Advait, Advait Vedan, the tradition of Advait Vedan, it is very difficult to accept the agnostic position, right? Your unconditioned ultimate reality cannot be said to be unknown right how can brahman be to be unknown how so whether it is the case of uh, professor kc bhattacharya whether it is the case of trv murthy sir whether it is the case of ss roy and few others also they have tried to settle the Kantian position in Advaitic line. In Advaitic line. Why? Just because they have the best tool of Aparokshanabhuti. Aparokshanabhuti. Brahman is subject matter of Aparokshanabhuti. It is subject matter of realization. But uh, in Kantian epistemology, you cannot have this tool, this epistemological tool of Aprokshanabhuti. So, that is, that is there. But, well, in, whereas in case of Kant, your unconditioned or nomina, that has to remain unknown and unknowable, but thinkable, but in Advaitic philosophical situation, what we find, to quote Professor S. Roy, the unconditioned is knowable par excellence, even when it cannot be known as an object, and that such a knowledge of it can be communicated through speech in the propositional form. The unknowability of the unconditioned is a necessary corollary of the objective attitude. This, this point is very important. Why Kant remains agnostic towards nominal entities? Why? Just because of objective attitude. Whenever you have objective attitude, you will have to keep your ultimate reality to be unknown and unknowable. <laughs> Processor Roy has made a very pertinent remark regarding regarding Kant's Copernican revolution. Immanuel Kant no doubt claims to have created a Copernican revolution in philosophy by shifting the center of gravity of knowledge, we all know, from the object to the subject. But his revolution remained incomplete in so far as Kant lapsed into the objective attitude and forgot that the subject is essentially free. Even while it is unobjectifiable, it is really knowable. Professor Rai has correctly pointed out that 
only if Kant would have realized the essential knowability of the self as freedom from objectivity, he would have given to the unconditioned a better status in the knowledge situation than he has and would not have connected it with a moral volition that negates the cognitive mode of consciousness. So, since my paper is quite lengthy, but uh, within five minutes, uh, I will try to communicate. Why should Kant insist on the nobility of the unconditioned as an object when he fully realizes that by very nature it defies such a categorization? The unconditioned, the Dwight Vedan, is none other than the Atman, which being at with pure consciousness is literally unobjectifiable. Perhaps because of its literally objectifiable essence, Kant has pronounced it as unknowable, literally objectifiable essence, Kant has pronounced it as unknowable and therefore lacking all meaning. <clears throat> the literally unobjectifiable cannot be known as an object, but it doesn't mean that object consciousness cannot be employed for giving a philosophically satisfying analysis of the nature of that knowledge in which the unconditioned and the transcendental is revealed. Here comes your Advaita Veda. What is literally unobjectifiable can be symbolically represented. What is literally unobjectifiable can be symbolically represented by the context of object consciousness to the Advaitin, to, to the to Advaitin, neither the object nor the object consciousness are non-existent and unreal. They only acquire different meaning in different attitude. The attitude in question are only two, unreflective and reflective. In the unreflective attitude, everything including the subject is sought to be known as an object. In the reflective attitude, there is necessarily the consciousness of a reality other than one that is objective. So, uh, I am moving to reformulation aspect because I have received the warning bell. A uh, reformulation of the Kantian critique of metaphysics would therefore need a reformulation of the entire motive for philosophizing. So long as philosophical thinking persists in what has been described as objective attitude, there will be, there will be an irresistible, irresistible or even a logically inevitable tendency towards the cherishing and adoring the definite and the limited. In such a situation, metaphysics will, will only have a status ancillary to science, only in a consciousness that has transcended the objective attitude. That's why it Does metaphysics come to its own? In the way, however, we, we come across an, an initial turning away from the limited and the determined. The preferential attitude in which Advaita is conceived is disinclined towards an adoring of the limited and the relational. Okay. Well, uh, in Advaitic philosophy, on the one hand, the realm of epistemology has been extended, and on the other hand, even the capacity of language also has been expanded. So now I'm coming to how capacity of language can be extended. Uh, with reference to Mahavakya Tattvam Asi. The capacity of language at large in Advaitic tradition as knowledge may have unmeant and unmeanable content, yet it is not incommunicable. To say that no significant statement be made about it is to miss the import of Mahavakya like Tattvam Asi. While such statement bear a total semblance in the form of propositions which mean an object, they should not be understood as such in every other respect. For example, normal propositions, what they are? They are empirical. They are sansargatma. Whereas metaphysical propositions are non-relational. Akhandartha. 
But a physical proposition is basically non empirical or non relational nature. That term, as he is really speaking, identity proposition, we all know it. Uh, the real implication of such identity proposition has to be grasped only a symbol of what literally speaking is unspeakable. It symbolizes what? Number one, the inadequacy of a speech, this literal phrase to communicate the immediacy of a suprasensuous experience. Number two, necessity of employing the entire paraphernalia of experience in the objective situation as a symbol for denoting that which defies connotive determination. Professor Roy has made that proposition like Tattvam Asi is a situational proposition. So he has said it is a situational proposition, it, is, it has a gestural significance. It, it is a situational proposition and should not be interpreted in terms of the logic of ordinary proposition. No. Which express an awareness of facts in the objective attitude. It refers to nothing which can be stretched out in spatio-temporal frame. Nor is this proposition a merely a verbal one, merely tautologous in a part. Not to reveal a state of being amenable to verification in sensuous experience. Yet it is not a nonsensical statement. It has a gestural significance. It has a gestural significance, or it prescribes in a determinably, determinably preferential mood a turning away from this or that, a rehearsal in one's consciousness of a mode of being completely inwardized. It only points to a situation in which the fullness of immediate experience is not lived through or left. By going out in quest of the land of heart's desire. Professor S. L. Professor S. L. Roy has beautifully ended the previous philosophical discussion by his concluding remark that what we have said here is no indictment to Kant. We could never have meant to class him with a positivist. All we have tried to show is the possibility of bringing the unconditioned within the field of theoretic consciousness. Grades of 30 conscious case, but we all know it. So, it is only a forward step in the direction of vindicating metaphysics by pointing out the manner in which metaphysical statement symbolizes a theoretic function. Thank you. Now I am free. But I will be glad if there are questions from me. Pleasure will be mine. Yeah. Are you saying this is key for the point? Here they are used. Why not? Yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, yeah. Uh, now, I will give you one Of the internal I have never said that in a uh, content philosophy, uh, your uh, objectivity can be transcended because he is confined to the objective attitude. For that reason, uh, in content philosophy, your unconditioned remains unknown and unknowable. That I have said. That is that I have said. Yeah, sure. Between? Between? Kant and Advaita Veda. Okay. No, no, no. Take it, take it. Although your question is very, very general in nature, it's very general in nature, but still, it is a very relevant question. I must say, it is a very relevant question. Actually, what I have said in my research paper is purely based upon the heritage of Shankar written by Professor Roy. And, uh, and uh, I'm convinced with his arguments also. Let's see what, what he's trying. You, do you know Professor S.S. Roy was direct student of Professor R.D. Ranade. Sir, am I right? Professor Jitashankar, sir? So he's a, <laughs> what, I, what, I, what, I, what I mean to communicate, to be very precise, 
he has seen the Advaitic tradition, beginning with your Adi Ranade, then A.C. Mukherjee, and, and you see uh, S.S. Roy and uh, Professor C.D. Sharma, they were batchmate. Hmm? So, fine. Actually, what uh, Professor S.S. Roy is doing in this portion of Heritage of Shankar, that the last part, that uh, he is not satisfied with Kantian agnostic position. He is not satisfied with Kantian agnostic position. So, in that situation, he has to come out. And coming out from this unpresent situation of agnosticism, he has to take a Dvaitic line. Uh, sure, sure. No. Oh, well, well. Well, uh, you see, you see, in heritage, uh, in uh, in heritage of Shankar, Professor S. S. Roy, Professor S. S. Roy has referred thrice. He has referred thrice. Uh, I can give you the original quotation also, where he is building his philosophical ideas on grades of theoretic consciousness, as we all know. And then your, comes your concept of philosophy and concept of philosophy, and, and and there there is a place. There is a place. So he is following the same line of Kesi Bhattacharya. He is following uh, the same line of Kesi Bhattacharya. Yes. Uh, uh, Professor Sukhdev, uh, how uh, I think you said that uh, the Tattvamasi statement, yeah. uh, though an identity statement, as you have said, oh. is a situational statement. Is it situational in what sense? And if it's situational in the empirical sense, then there is a conflict that. Uh, Tattvamasi cannot be an empirical let, state. Let, let, let me let, let me clarify. When Professor S. L. Ra is saying that uh, Tattvam Asi, that thou art, is a situational statement, it simply means that uh, differing the situation. One situation is of unreflective level, another situation is of reflective level. Right. So this is a situational statement moving from unreflective to reflective. This, uh, this is the meaning of situational uh, statement. And, uh, and the meaning of uh, gestural statement? Yes. Gestural statement? Uh, here gestural means, uh, here, here gestural, here gestural, please. Yeah. Here gestural means we are doing a sort of rehearsal. We are doing to we are trying to do a sort of rehearsal. Rehearsal of what? What? Rehearsal of not going outside, rather moving inside, inwardized experiences. Inwardized experiences, that is a rehearsal. And that is that has general significance. I think Adhitin should agree with this. But my hunch is this, uh, sure. that this should be a cognitive statement because it extends our knowledge. So it cannot be gestural. It must be something deeply cognitive. It extends our knowledge of ourselves that we are the same as the Brahman. So yes. that's, uh, no, that, that is, is that the is also. Uh, basic no, no, no. of this statement. Uh, uh, tell me, tell me very, tell me one thing very simple. Tell me one thing very simple. Uh, what is the purpose of Tattvamasi? What is the purpose of Tattvamasi? Same. Same. It, it can't. It, uh, it can't be tweeted. It it can't. It can't be tweeted as non-cognitive statement. Who is saying it is non-cognitive statement? Gestural, gestural in one sense, but, but, uh, what is what is what is un, what is unobjectifiable? That to be can be spoken. Is spoken symbolically. Spoken symbolically. Uh, uh, Not in literal sense. Yeah. Uh, very, uh, see, uh, just one second with your permission. Okay. No, I'll. I'll, I'll that means I'm bailed out. I'm, I'm bailed out. I'm bailed out. I'm bailed out. See, the last question that you can ask, please. Uh, you know, uh, see, a uh, very clear exposition. I really adore your, uh, you know, way you are prepared. 
I just want to uh, go back to Professor Mahan, so Pradhan's uh, like uh, observation. Is it an empirical statement or a transcendental statement? That's sir. It is an empirical statement only because Dr. one minute. It is an empirical statement because it is guru saying to the teacher, uh, student. So it is an empirical, but it is a trans. It has a transcendental implication, but because if you say somebody Tattamashi, he does not understand anything. Right, right. So it has a transcendental, and therefore the question of gestural does not come here at all. Like no question, like the gesture has. A, do you write SS Rai writes about the gestural or yeah. it, he writes gestural? Yeah, yeah. I see. But, then uh, we have but, to. Uh, but your context can be the different. Ah, context. Your context can, can be different. Yes. One. Yeah. But it is an empirical statement only because. Fine, fine. There is no problem accepting this uh, position. Yeah. That is the no. Uh, no, no. proposition with uh. transcendental implication. Huh. Right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Thank you. And even for the good discussions uh, with you. Now, please, Grace, with the speaker, please ask. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sanjay Kumar Shukla, for the, the very interesting paper. And uh, uh, yes, those who want to ask question, you can please keep in your mind, and we can have a um, meaningful time of que questioning again. After all, the papers have been presented. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, we know that it's not very fair. All of them come from far off place and giving just 15 minutes is not very fair. But uh, um, as program is already scheduled, kindly bear with us. Now may I request uh, Dr. Subra Jyoti Das from Shantini Ketan to kindly uh, come forward and deliver the lecture. How, how much time do I have? 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Yeah. Respected chair of the session, all the dignitaries present in the room, I uh, wish to express my, I know, some of my uh, views over the issue, over an issue. The paper of my, the title of my paper is. Uh, is Shankar Deva an Advaitian? That was my uh, that was my title uh, in the light of Ramana Maharshi's thoughts. So here, yeah. Now the thing is that uh, Shankar Deva is uh, someone. I just would uh, say two words before I proceed. He is a Vaishnava uh, from Assam, someone who has not been that well read uh, in the context of Vaishnava Vedanta. And I, I chose to take up this because this area has not been taken up in that way in the larger, uh, uh, you know, context through the prism of the post-independent, uh, you know, uh, prism of the post-independent developments in Advaita Veda. So I, that's why my my paper is divided into two parts. First is why I choose to take uh, Ramana Maharshi as the reference point, and thereafter I have taken up the issues uh, in him. To some detail, I don't know if I'll get the chance to read the whole of it, but I'll, I'll try to the extent I can. Now, the thing is uh, that you know uh, the way in which we receive Advaita Vedanta post from the post-independent phase is that bhakti has been accepted as an appropriate and complete method of realizing the Advaitin, the Advaita position, the Aham Brahmasmi position. But that is uh, in Upadesha Sara. He gives a very, Raman Maharshi gives a very clear uh, picture of what could be the link between Saguna Bhakti and the realization of Brahman. The same Brahman, which uh, for Shankara was something to be known through the path of knowledge. Now, what Raman Maharshi does, he gives uh, the clear note that Jivana Mukti is possible through Saguna Bhakti. It is something, uh, you know, which was perhaps not available in Shankara. Though in Shankara, we have all those three forms of bhakti, the Saguna Bhakti, 
the nirguna which he calls it akshara upasana as an introduction in the first part i have written then i'll go to the, my second part the second uh, is the akshara upasana in the form of nirguna bhakti which comes almost at par with the jnana and after attainment of jnana again there is a form of bhakti which continues in the form of what they call para bhakti uh, in his commentary on that shloka chaturvidha bhajanti imam yono pashyati arjuna arto arthati jignasu jnani cha bharatasha there he gives that input that a further bhakti also continues but the problem with the, the shankara's scheme that i find is he does not give the status of saguna bhakti as something which can be a ladder up to that ultimate experience for him it stops there as as something you know as a, as a purifier of might now if i take ramad maharshi as the stand of course the process begins i i i would say from nilakantha suri itself from the next level of uh, advaita commentaries which had begun and there is appropriation of saguna bhakti in some form or the other which moves down the line and you find glimpses of the same thing happening somewhere in kabir somewhere in shri ramakrishna and so on that is there of course but there are ambiguities you know uh, when it comes to kabir also there are ambiguities when it comes to shri ramakrishna also because we there are is a great debate over whether shri ramakrishna can be treated as an advaitya or not because of his accepting uh, nitya sakara proposition as something valid within the scheme of his uh, his prescriptions that the you know the uh, ishta is nitya sakara for some some devotees now but when i come down the line and reach raman maharshi the point becomes crystal clear to me and there is no ambiguity left and therefore i can take it as a reference point to build my argument further this is what i have attempted here three basic propositions that i derive from ramana is the three basic brahma satya jagat mithya and so on jiva brahma yana and further is the relation between the saguna and the advaita that aspect is very clearly taken up this is what we mean even when he would say and even while defining karma yoga in his upadesha sara he ends up by saying ishvararpitam nechaya krutam chitta shodhakam mukti sadhakam so that becomes the tool for mukti not in the shankara sense where he would limit the function of karma even while commenting on a shloka like yata pravrittir bhutanam yenam sarvam idam tatam svakarmana tamabhyarcha siddhim vindati mahalam he says the siddhi which is referred in that shloka it's in the 18th chapter of the gita it's only the purified mind which enables the person to get into the next level of uh, the, the, the discipline now taking these points you know now when i analyze what has been supplied by shankar dev he is one uh, vaishnava saint who was contemporary to shri chaitanya shri chaitanya's uh, 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 Shankar Deva's period is from 1449 to 1568, whereas Sri Chaitanya is there from 18 uh, from 1486 to 1534. That's the time period. And I I see that you know he gives the input in a very in a very uh, precise way. I'll just read out from my paper what I have gathered from his writing. Most of his writings are in a language called Braja Bhuli, which is not Braja Bhasha. a particular artificial language that he uh, formulated to uh, you know sort of spread bhakti in assam in uh, in that zone of india uh just let me read that part which i have gathered from his writing on many occasions shankar deva seems to agree with ramanuja's vishishta advaita he describes creatures as the body of god one of his compositions uh portraying everything uh one of his compositions portraying everything includes insects and snake as body of the lord but still shankar deva cannot be called as a qualified monist since ramanuja depicts all the sentient and insentient beings as part of the body of brahma whereas for shankar deva each creature is equivalent to god the lord resides within each body both shankar deva and ramanuja maintain that all creatures merge in brahma in the end but Uh, yet in vishishta advaita a difference between jiva and brahman remains even during the last phase of pralaya as the jiva remains embedded in brahman in subtle form now this is erased by shankar shankar deva he would say like an advaitian that once the ultimate realization of god takes place the difference you know the, even the subtle difference 
it also uh, disappears there. for shankar deva god is uttam purusha he addresses lord as the and portrays himself as his servant but he is ne neither a dvaita dvaitin like madhva nor a dvaita uh, dvaita dvait uh, or dvaita vadin like madhva nor a dvaita dvaitin like nimbarka since for him unlike madhva there is no ultimate difference between jiva and ishvara in agreement with nimbarka in order to explain his creation shankar deva didn't resort to parinam vad only in addition nimbarka worshiped two entities unlike shankar deva who worshiped only krishna now this is uh, once you take this whole point up chronologically the thing becomes clear in the second uh, point chronologically he was a contemporary of sri chaitanya the last classical vaishnava vedanti but philosophically he differs not only from achinta veda veda of chaitanya but also from shuddha dvaita of vallabha shuddha dvaita resorts to parinam vad only there is no cross difference between achinta veda veda and dvaita dvaita since both prescribe i mean as far as i have taken the point since both prescribe worship of the two entities except the fact that instead of explaining the relation between jiva and brahman as identity and difference the former choose to declare it as something that cannot be taught in terms of known categories of understanding now the gross similarity between shankar deva and other vaishnava vedantins in this uh, aspiration is the aspiration to get liberated in one of the most famous borgi you know that is uh, the form of composition that he has left he prays a uh, lord to give uh, uh, him rid from the ocean of painful world which is characterized by flux but in addition the subtle differences pointed above the most important difference between shankar deva and other vaishnava vedanti is unlike all of them shankar deva no one insists that the death of the physical body is a necessity for the emancipation of the jivas now going to that you know that aspect of uh, thing where uh, there are some you know brojo bhasha texts i i would just uh, say uh, you know joto jigam jivangam kito patangam like that you know this uh, this, uh, this this is script uh, which is there from there i have uh, taken and have given the analysis in the paper pokhi koroi dhori koru porosani bikokhito pushpavan jeno juga phroste dunay abhakhya korilo nirmalam this is a language that he has used now up to this point you know it goes most important thing that i find in shankar dev is that you see in the entire classical phase of vaishnava vedanta which begins from ramanuja and ends in chaitanya in this entire phase none of these vaishnava vedantins accepted the possibility of jivanamukti this is something which has to be attained only as videha as as something that goes beyond death well in shankara of course he accepted videha mukti because he had to explain the existence of the jivan mukta in this world and he did it based on the existence of prarabdha karma and the exhaustion of prarabdha karma and so on it is well known to us but the aspect of mukti which was somewhere uh, you know taken up by shankar deva was not taken up during his contemporaries this is what i find and that's why this is an area perhaps which needs more exploration you know in my point of view i started working on it although uh, the answer that i have to the question that i have raised i, I come to the uh, last part of uh, because we are like uh, running out of time uh, the question is that can we treat him as an advaitian perhaps not you know perhaps not because uh, he places the saguna and nirguna aspect of krishna because krishna as an avatar of vishnu is this Uh, god or the ishta devata for him and explains the existence of this creation just in a way an advaita vedanti would do but still for him the saguna aspect of it in ramanuj what happens the saguna is the only thing nirguna won't exist nirguna exists but in a different sense you would interpret it in case of shankar dev what happens the nirguna is there but as, as something inferior to the saguna so and the creation this universe becomes a play field you know of lord where the divine sport will take place so uh, that's uh, that's the second thing third point is that you know uh, the, the method of course the method is that of bhakti you will not subscribe to the advaitians method of uh, shravana manana nidhyasana you would say that yes the maya is that uh, factor which makes the whole thing happen but the maya has to be transcended by the grace of god 
so he maintains some basic uh, you know uh, propositions with respect to the uh, the vaishnava uh, vaishnavas who are there but uh, what i find intriguing in him is you know the openings that he has given the opening to the discourse of jivana mukti which was not available up to shri chaitanya for such a long period of time of almost 600 years ranging from ramanuj secondly the nirguna aspect of it which comes into uh, uh, into play in the advaitian mode of it well that's another point uh, which 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 comes up and that's why this is a this is a you know this is an area which has somehow left uh, unexplored because of the language and i don't know for different reasons uh, he has been he has not been read i'm i'm repeating he is a contemporary of of, of shri chaitanya and belongs to that period of time so i uh, took that issue up and i wanted to see it through the post independent because in only in the post independent phase of uh, advaita vedanta it became crystal clear that jivana mukti is possible through saguna bhakti uh, so in this way i have uh, formulated uh, my thoughts in this paper and uh, try to present my views that's all i have to submit for the day uh, now i i i would uh, welcome your comments questions and queries whatever or uh, it today i was pointing out to one of our professors <clears throat> that uh, in our vaita we are saying that brahman is not aware of his own consciousness so i got the information that in advaita we are negated the mind of brahman brahman is not having the mind so that's why he is not aware then why he is needing you are pointing that the create the creatures as body of god if the brahman is not have mind then why he need the body uh well here uh, the body it is uh, it is uh, it is not exactly in the you could say here uh, the body here is not exactly in the sense in which ramanuja would take it okay it is not if i refer to shankar there was exposition on it it is not the way in which ramanuja takes it i said there's a similarity between what ramanuja says and what he submits okay but there are differences because uh, body in shankar deva it becomes nirguna just like uh, uh, you know uh, just like Uh, your uh, uh, shankar so uh, that problem uh, which you were saying i don't think that would exist in his case you know at least in his exposition now if you take the uh, if you get into the advaita uh, you know aspect of it that's a different issue i'm not dealing with it uh, in this paper but uh, shankar there was exposition he has done something like that you know he equates the bodies and he would say that each body is equivalent to brahman it's the you know the all pervading and uh, the 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 immanent aspect of it the the visible aspect of it is because of maya that's how he submits it so i think it makes that in that sense yeah. Okay, no, no. But then, what do you mean by indirect mukti? Can you explain to me what what exactly do you mean by that? okay no no the point is that uh, you know if uh, i i just couldn't follow the exact uh, uh, you know sense in which you were using the secondary mukti thing if the karma binds you 
to its results. Anyway, it is not give you, giving you freedom. Only that karma, which doesn't bind you to result, if at all that can be performed in that particular way, will be a tool for your freedom. Yes? If the karma is sakama, the karma is binding on you. If the bhakti is sakama, even that also is binding on you. That binds you back. So it's not giving you freedom. The nishkama will become a tool for the freedom. All right. Now that nishkama for Shankara, kind of a philosopher, I, I would rather, uh, uh, you know, like to agree with you. Okay. Uh, your terminology of the secondary, you know, the secondary uh, mukti. In Shankara's way, when he would say that nishkama karma can become a tool for the purification of mind. Well, bhakti can become a tool for the purification of mind. And unless and until you have a pure mind, you cannot engage in the later stages of your sadhana. You cannot get into jnana yoga. So you need that freedom. You need that discipline, that purified mind. In that sense, it will be, you know, I would happy, I'd be happy to use your terminology and say that it is secondary form of mukti because it leads you to that higher, uh, higher thing. Now, this is something, of course, this is something very interesting. Okay. How saguna bhakti becomes a tool for transcending and it goes and takes you to the Advaita level. Very difficult to understand perhaps in ordinary, you know, cognitive uh, logical framework. Well, but this is something that these people, they say that we have experienced. This is, this is uh, with, just with reference to, you know, uh, the history. I just go a little, little away from what I'm saying. This was the main tussle between the Sufis and Islam, you know, that the bhakti becomes the tool to claim that Aham Brahmasmi or Anal Haq. How do you go to that next level of experience? That, that is very difficult to understand. But the practitioners, you know, they claimed it. And in the, uh, in the what do you call, uh, Bhashya Parampara, as I said, that from Nilakanta Suri itself, once Shankara completed the commentary, Ananda Giri almost was his sub-commentator. Then the process of commentary begins from Nilakanta Suri. They are all Advaiti commentators. They started accepting Saguna Bhakti. You know, as something which can be placed there, it comes on and on and on. And finally, you have people, as I said, like Sri Ramakrishna, okay, who gives that note, complete note, okay, that bhakti itself would lead you to that level. Of course, there is there is there is uh, there is serious debate on whether we can take uh, Ramakrishna as an Advaitian or not, because of as I said, acceptance of Nitya Sakara, uh, 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 you know, of 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 bhakti uh, of, of 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 the Lord for some of the devotees. But it comes down and then it is accepted. It is a bit difficult, a bit difficult to understand, but they have accepted it. And the practitioners, they said that it is possible. The transcendence comes, ultimately you get the same experience. So, okay, okay, okay. So I, I, I think I could, uh, I could uh, give you the answer. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Okay, thank you so much yeah, for listening to me. सबको मेरा नमस्ते श्रद्धे प्रोफेसर एसपी पांडे जी जो इस सेशन की अध्यक्षता कर रहे हैं श्रद्धे प्रोफेसर आरसी प्रधान जी प्रोफेसर आनंद मिश्र जी प्रोफेसर जटा शंकर जी प्रोफेसर और जितने भी मेरे कलीग यहां बैठे हुए हैं मेरे स्टूडेंट बैठे हुए हैं मेरा पेपर जो मैं प्रेजेंट करने जा रहा हूं थोड़ी लीक से हटके तो नहीं कहना चाहिए सही है इसको छोड़ दें ठीक है तो जैसा कि हमारा जो टाइटल है इस सेमिनार का वो है पोस्ट इंडिपेंडेंस अद्वैत थिंकर्स जब मैंने इसके बारे में सोचना शुरू किया तो मुझे लगा कि मुझे जो मुख्य रूप से मुझे ऐसा लगा कि जो सबसे महत्वपूर्ण चीज है वो है जगत की अवधारणा जितने भी शंकर के बाद जो दूसरे 
दार्शनिक आते हैं जो खासकर पोस्ट इंडिपेंडेंस अद्वैत थिंकर्स में तो उसको लेके मैंने कुछ ऐसा एक पेपर बनाने की कोशिश की है जिसमें हम लोग रमन महर्षि की पोजिशन के सी भट्टाचार्य के कुछ यश दोशल्य की कुछ चीजें देखने की कोशिश करेंगे तो उसके पहले मुझे जो अभी एक सुबह ही मैं सोच रहा था कि देखिए जो भारत की आजादी की घटना है वह कितनी महत्वपूर्ण है इस अर्थ में भारत की आजादी घटना अपने आप में पूरी दुनिया के, के के लिए एक अत्यंत महत्वपूर्ण घटना है इस घटना के बाद पूरी दुनिया का और विशेषकर भारत की चिंतन चिंतन प्रणाली में यहाँ के या यहाँ के दर्शन में एक आमूल चूल उत्परिवर्तन हो जाना चाहिए था लेकिन ऐसा हुआ नहीं पहली बार ऐसा हुआ भारत की आजादी में कि किसी देश ने आध्यात्मिक मूल्यों के आधार पर राजनीतिक आजादी प्राप्त की ऐसा पहले कभी नहीं हुआ यहाँ पे देखिए मैं कहना क्या चाह रहा हूँ कि इस बात पे ध्यान आकर्षित करना चाहता हूँ कि यहाँ पे हो क्या रहा है कि जो हमारी हम लोग बात कर रहे हैं पॉलिटिकल फ्रीडम की तो जो बाहर की आजादी है हमारा जो इंडिपेंडेंस है और उसमें इसमें क्या हुआ साध्य क्या हो गया बाहर की आजादी हो गया और साधन क्या बन रहा है उल्टा हो गया मामला साधन क्या बन रहा है हमारे आध्यात्मिक मूल्य जो गांधी जी में तिलक में अरविंद के माध्यम से हमारे उसमें प्रवेश कर रहे हैं स्वतंत्रता संग्राम में तो ये देखिए इस इस पूरी घटना के बाद होना क्या चाहिए था कि जगत को ज्यादा महत्वपूर्ण ऐसा हुआ भी है और लेकिन हम हमारे बीच कहीं ना कहीं कोई कशमस कस, कसमकस अभी भी बची हुई है कि एक तरफ हमको कहीं ऐसा लग रहा है कि नहीं जो जो बाहर की दुनिया है ये जगत है इसके बाद आजादी के बाद भी ये कम महत्वपूर्ण है और शायद कोई ऐसी कोई चीज कोई ऐसी दुनिया है जो इससे बिल्कुल अलग है इसी के बारे में मुख्य रूप से ये पेपर मेरा है तो मैं अब ज्यादा चूंकि समय बिल्कुल नहीं है तो मैं सबसे पहले रमन महर्ष की पोजिशन बताता हूँ चूंकि पूरे पेपर पढ़ने का टाइम नहीं है पेपर भी थोड़ा बड़ा हो ही गया है आ, आ, बात यह है कि ये इसका रेफरेंस ये है कि अक्सर आपने देखा होगा कि शंकराचार्य की जो मुख्य रूप से आलोचना की जाती है वो इस बात की की जाती है कि जो जनरली हम का जो एक पॉपुलर वर्जन है वो ये है कि ब्रह्म सत्यम जगत मिथ्या सारे लोगों ने अगर आप कमला कर मिश्री जी की किताब भी देखेंगे लास्ट में जो उनकी जो सेविजम के ऊपर उनकी किताब है तो उसमें बहुत विस्तृत कम से कम चालीस पचास पेज में उन्होंने आलोचना की है इस इस पॉइंट की कि वो मिथ्या क्यों कह रहे हैं जगत शं, शंकर मिथ्या क्यों कह रहे हैं तो जब यही बात रमर महर्षि के सामने लाई जाती है तो वो कहते हैं वो, वो उनका उत्तर क्या है इसको मैं पढ़ के आपको बताना चाहूंगा ताकि आप अच्छे से रमर महर्षि की पोजिशन को देख सकें और इसी से पूरी आगे की हमारी चर्चा आगे बढ़ सकती है जब उनसे पूछा जाता है कि वेद में सृष्टि विषय रमन महर्षि के अनुसार जगत का प्रश्न ही मनुष्य को उसके मूल प्रश्न से भटकाने वाला है उसको जानने का प्रयास करना चाहिए जो सृष्टि के विषय में प्रश्न कर रहा है इस सृष्टि का हेतु जगत का ज्ञान करना ना होकर स्वयं का ज्ञान करना है जब उनसे पूछा जाता है कि वेद में सृष्टि विषय अनेक सिद्धांत पाए जाते हैं तो उनमें से कौन सत्य कौन सा है इस प्रश्न पर रमन महर्षि का कहना है कि सभी ऋषियों ने विभिन्न समयों में सत्य के विभिन्न पहलुओं को देखा जिनमें से प्रत्येक किसी एक पक्ष पर अधिक बल देता है आप इन इन विरुद्ध विधानों की चिंता क्यों करते हैं वेद का मुख्य लक्ष्य अविनाशी आत्मा के स्वरूप का दर्शन करना है एवं हमें सिखाना है कि हम वही हैं तो देखिए अभी इतना इसमें बहुत सारी चीजें हैं बहुत सारे जो हमारे रमन महर्षि आगे बहुत सारी अलग अलग जहाज मैंने इनको इकट्ठा किया है रमन महर्षि में और इसमें जैसे वो कहते हैं कि जो श्रेष्ठ सिद्धांत है सृष्टि के विषय का वो आजादवादी है तो वो कहते हैं जो ज्ञानी के लिए तो कोई सृष्टि है ही नहीं उसके बाद सृष्टि दृष्टिवाद है उसके बाद दृष्टि सृष्टिवाद है जो एकदम सांख्यवारी पोजिशन बन जाती दो बन जाते हैं तो वो कहते हैं कि ये सारे ये उनके लिए हैं ये वो कहते थे रमन महर्षि की पोजिशन ये है कि जो जो प्रश्न पूछ रहा है वेदों में उपनिषद में तो उसकी दशा के अनुसार ऋषि उस तरह से उत्तर दे रहा है लेकिन अगर जो सच में जो पोजीशन है वेदांत की रमन महर्षि के अनुसार वो ये है कि कभी कोई सृष्टि हुई ही नहीं ये इस पोजीशन से वो चलते हैं देखिए और आगे जो सबसे महत्वपूर्ण बात है जिससे हम आगे बढ़ेंगे इस पेपर में वो ये है कि रमन महर्षि के अनुसार माया विषय विचार को ठीक ढंग से समझे बिना ही शंकर की आलोचना की जाती है शंकर ने कहा ब्रह्म सत्य है जगत मिथ्या है नंबर थ्री जगत ब्रह्म है ये उन्हीं के मैं कोट कर रहा हूँ रमन महर्षि के तीन पोजिशन बता रहे हैं पहली पोजिशन है ब्रह्म सत्य है जगत मिथ्या है जगत ब्रह्म है वे दूसरे अविधान पर रुके नहीं रमन महर्षि की व्याख्या के अनुसार शंकर का जो अंतिम चीज वो है कि जगत अल्टीमेटली ब्रह्म ही है तो मैं सोच रहा था कि दरअसल जो पूरी सारी जो कंफ्यूजन जो सारा हो रहा है शायद इसलिए हो रहा है क्योंकि हम जनरली ये कहते हैं कि ब्रह्म सत्यम जगत मिथ्या जीव ब्रह्म होना पर हमको ये कहना चाहिए कि ब्रह्म सत्यम जगत 
जगत मिथ्या जगत ब्रह्मो न पर जगत भी अल्टीमेटली क्योंकि रमर महर्षि की पॉजिशन ये है कि जब जो जाग की आंख जब हम ज्ञान की दृष्टि से देखेंगे तो जो अल्टीमेटली जगत भी ब्रह्म ही है जगत और ब्रह्म में वास्तव में कोई फर्क नहीं है तो मेरा पॉइंट यहाँ यही है इस जगह पे आके रमर महर्ष में भी जो एकदम बिल्कुल परंपरागत दार्शनिक है कि जब तक हम इस जगत को जो हमारा ये जगत है जो जिसमें हम रोज जी रहे हैं जो हमारा जो हमारी जिसमें हमारी चिंता है जिसमें हमारी जब तक हम इसको ब्रह्म की तरह नहीं देखेंगे जब तक इसको हम सत्ता प्रदान नहीं करेंगे अब हम क्यों नहीं कर पाएंगे क्या आवरण है क्या अज्ञान है ये अलग प्रश्न बन जाता है तब तक कोई भी चीज आगे बढ़ नहीं सकती इसके बाद जो दूसरा मैंने दार्शनिक चुना था इसके लिए वो चुना था केसी भट्टाचार को तो चूंकि केसी भट्टाचार आप सबको पता है कि बहुत ही उनकी जो वो एक अकादमिक दार्शनिक है और उन बहुत अच्छी तरीके से कांट को पूर्व पक्ष बना के जैसे अभी हमारे संजय शुक्ला जी कह रहे थे कि शायद मैंने प्रश्न उनसे नहीं पूछा कि कांटियन विश्लेषण को आगे बढ़ाया जा रहा है लेकिन मुझे लग रहा है कम से कम के सी भट्टाचार्य मैंने केवल एक ही किताब उनके अच्छे से पढ़ी हुई कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ फिलोसफी के सी भट्टाचार्य की तो उसके आधार पर जो उनकी पॉजिशन बनती है के सी भट्टाचार्य की वो ये बनती है कि वहां पर ऐसा नहीं कि के सी भट्टाचार्य कांट की पोजीशन की विश्लेषण को आगे बढ़ा रहे हैं मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि देखिए पहले ही शुरुआत में ही कॉन्सेप्ट कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ फिलोसफी में वो अपनी बात कह देते हैं कि जो कांट की पोजीशन है वो ये है कि जो तत्व इट इज इट इज इट इज थिंकेबल इट जो न्यूमेना इज थिंकेबल इट इज नॉट नोएबल लेकिन कैसी भट्टाचार्य अपनी शुरुआत यहाँ से करते हैं कि इट इज इट इज नोएबल इट इज नॉट थिंकेबल और उनके सारे जो स्तर हैं किसी भट्टाचार्य को यही बताते हैं कैसे कैसे ट्रुथ केबल लेवल पे आते आते वो बिल्कुल थिंकेबल नहीं है उसके नीचे की स्टेज में कुछ थिंकेबल है तो अल्टीमेट पोजिशन बिल्कुल वेदांत की तरह किसी भट्टाचार्य की बनती है कि वहां भी वो नोएबल ही है वो थिंकेबल बिल्कुल नहीं है तो इस तरह से मुझे ये बात उस समय की गई थी लेकिन यहाँ पे जो मुख्य बात है जो मैं बताना चाह रहा हूँ कि जैसे के भट्टाचार्य क्या कर रहे हैं आप अगर कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ फिलोसफी को देखेंगे तो उसमें सबसे पहले वो कहते हैं कि चार लेवल है सैद्धांतिक चेतना के चार लेवल है पहला लेवल एम्पीरिकल लेवल अनुभवी चेतना किस तरह कह सकते हैं हिंदी में उसको हम और दूसरा लेवल है प्योर ऑब्जेक्ट का लेवल तो उनकी पोजिशन ये है केसी भट्टाचार्य की कि जो ये इम्पीरिकल लेवल है जिसमें इसमें हो क्या रहा है कि पूरी तरह से जो इंद्रियों से हम जो जगत देखते हैं तो ये इसमें हम तथ्यात्मक जगत देखते हैं इसमें कोई फिलोसफी होती है इसलिए वो फिलोसफी से इसको बाहर ही रखते हैं किसी भट्टाचार्य जो फिलोसफी कब शुरू होती है फिलोसफी वहां से शुरू होती है जब हमारा जो सेल्फ है जब हमारा जो बाहर का ऑब्जेक्ट है ये सेल्फ सब्सिस्टेंस होता है सेल्फ सब्सटेंस 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 का मतलब क्या हुआ कि हम हम मतलब जो तत्व है जो आत्मा है उसके हिसाब से जब बाहर का जगत देखते हैं तब तत्व युवा का जन्म होता है जो हमारा जो तथ्यात्मक जगत है उसके वो तो साइंस का साइंस का वो उसका अध्ययन कर रहा है वो हमारा मतलब दर्शन शास्त्र में वो हमारे जो खोजबीन का विषय हमारा नहीं है तो यहाँ पे आके देखिए जब हम जब हम इसको इसमें फर्क क्या पड़ता है इसमें फर्क ये पड़ता है चूंकि पढ़ने का टाइम नहीं नहीं तो मैंने उसको अच्छे से व्यवस्थित किया था फर्क ये पड़ रहा है कि यहाँ पे क्या हो रहा है कि जैसे जो ऑब्जेक्ट है वो फिर से यहाँ पे जो तत्व है बिल्कुल वही रमन महर्षि वाली पॉजिशन ही द्वारा आप रिमेम्बर कर सकते हैं कि जगत प्रेम है मतलब जब हम आत्मा के आत्मा आत्मा अवस्थित जो जो जगत है जो जो विषय है किसी भट्टाचार्य की पॉजिशन तो वो प्योर ऑब्जेक्ट है बिल्कुल साइंस की पॉजिशन से बिल्कुल हम बिल्कुल विपरीत पॉजिशन बन जाती है यहाँ पे और फिर उसके आगे के स्तर जो हमारा ना इस पेपर का विषय है तो यहाँ पे मैंने ऐसा सोचा कि देखिए वहां गलती क्या हुई कांटे से कांट को इवन ऐसा नहीं है कि कांट की लाइन में आगे बढ़ रहे हैं किसी भट्टाचार्य मुझे ऐसा लगता है वो वो बता रहे हैं कि कांट गलती कहाँ कर रहा था कांट गलती ये कर रहा था उसने क्या किया था कि सब्जेक्ट को और ऑब्जेक्ट को अलग अलग कर दिया और फिर जब दो, दोनों को बिल्कुल अलग अलग कर दिया फिर वो समझ लीजिए कि पूरे पाश्चात दर्शन में यही हो रहा है कि पहले आपने सब्जेक्ट को अलग कर दिया ऑब्जेक्ट को अलग कर दिया और फिर उसके बाद सब्जेक्ट ऑब्जेक्ट को समझने की को कोशिश कर रहा है और जब आपने शुरुआत में ही ज्ञान विमान समय पहले ही अलग कर दिया फिर आप उसको कभी समझ नहीं सकते हैं ये सारी प्रॉब्लम हमेशा अनंत काल तक इस तरह की चर्चा चलती रहेगी ये पोजिशन संक्षिप्त में केसी भट्टाचार्य के अब तीसरा जो महत्वपूर्ण दार्शनिक है मेरे लिए वो है शल तो उसमें आप देखिए शल्य जी कई कई कारणों से हमारे लिए बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है क्योंकि तो देखिए हम आज जिस फिलोसॉफी ऑफ डिकंस्ट्रक्शन के युग में हम लोग जी रहे हैं और हम जानते हैं कि कोई भी कोई भी चीज कोई एक पाठ नहीं हो सकता है कई पाठ हो सकते हैं चीजों के तो कैसे मतलब मुझे लग रहा है शल्य जी का दर्शन इस बात का उदाहरण है कि कैसे वही वो कहते हैं कि पूरे प्रेरणा तो वो उपनिषद से ले रहे हैं वेदांत से ले रहे हैं लेकिन कैसे एक वेदांत का कोई एक नवीन पाठ तैयार हो स
टोटली बिल्कुल बिल्कुल अलग हो शंकर से अलग हो पूरी परंपरा से अलग हो इसलिए थोड़ी शल्य जी को समझने में थोड़ी हमको मुश्किल भी होती है क्योंकि हमारा जो परंपरागत मन है वो कहीं उसको हमें समझने नहीं देता क्योंकि वो उनकी पूरी जो पदावली है उनका जो रचना है उनका जो लॉजिक है उनका जो विश्लेषण बिल्कुल एकदम नया है लेकिन देखिए चूंकि हमारा चूंकि विषय का जगत है जगत में हम अगर उनकी पोजिशन देखें तो इसमें मुझे बोलना पड़ेगा कहाँ है वो शल्य जी हाँ ये है शल्य जी स्वयं एक्सेप्ट करते हैं कि पहले वो जब शुरुआती दौर में जब वो यंग थे तो वो भी अनुभववादी थे और उनको लगता था कि जो मूर और रसेल के जो आर्गूमेंट है उनका उनसे बड़ा तो कोई मतलब उनका कोई तोड़ हो ही नहीं सकता उन आर्गूमेंट का लेकिन धीरे धीरे कैसे उनको जब और और प्रवेश करते हैं तो धीरे धीरे क्या होता है कि फिर वो सोचते हैं कि नहीं हम वस्तु को जो दोष क्या है अनुभववाद में अनुभववाद में दोष ये है कि ये हमारे पूरे पूरे जो हमारा जगत के दृष्टिकोण को इम्पीरिकल सीमित कर देता है पूरा जड़ बना देता है अगर हम इस तरह से देखें अगर हम इम्पीरिकल लेवल पे ही जगत को देख पा रहे हैं अनुभववाद अनुभववाद के हिसाब से देख पा रहे हैं तो ये होता है और उसके बाद उनको लगा शायद कांट की तरह हम इस तरह से देख सकते हैं कि, कि हम बौद्धिक अवधारणाओं में जगत को देख सकते हैं वहां भी देखते हैं कि हम हम अगर इस तरह से बौद्धिक अवधारणाओं में भी पाते हैं कि अगर हम देखना चाहें तो नहीं देख सकते हैं अब चूंकि हमारे पास समय कम है समय बहुत कम है ना कितना समय मेरे पास अभी फाइव मिनट बात है अच्छा तो फिर अगर मैं सिर्फ संक्षिप्त में बता रहा हूँ आगे कैसे बढ़ रहे हैं वो पहले अनुभववाद फिर अनुभववाद को देखते हैं कि वो बहुत सीमित दृष्टिकोण है फिर बौद्धिक अवधारणा की तरफ आते हैं फिर चेतना की सापेक्षता में उसको देखने की कोशिश करते हैं फिर फिर लास्ट में जिद विमर्श में जाके वो कहते हैं कि अभी तक वो असल में इस बात को समझ नहीं पा रहे थे शल्य जी देखिए कितनी अब हमको ऐसा पांच मिनट के पेपर में ऐसा पंद्रह मिनट किसी की बात सुनकर ऐसा लगता है कि ये कोई सरल बात है लेकिन कितनी बड़ी यात्रा है कम से कम तीस चालीस वर्ष में धीरे धीरे शल्य जी वहां पहुंचते हैं कि वास्तव में जो पूरी समझने में गलती क्यों हो रही है क्योंकि वो हम लोग कैसे समझ रहे हैं हम इसी तरह से अलग अलग विषय और विषय को देखिए हमने रमन महत्व भी यही कह रहे हैं कि विषय विषय को अलग 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 करके आप नहीं समझ सकते अलग अलग करके देखेंगे तो अज्ञान है केसी भट्टाचार्य भी यही कह रहे हैं कि विषय विषय को जब हम जब हम सेल्फ सबसिस्टेंस विषय की तरह देखेंगे चीजों को तभी उसको देख पाएंगे उसी तरह से सलीज भी कह रहे हैं कि जो तत्व को क्या होना चाहिए भाव के भावात्मक होना चाहिए अकेले अगर अकेले भाव कहेंगे सत्ता कहेंगे तो क्या हो उसमें ये दोस्त है कि फिर आदमी के ईषण का क्या होगा उसकी अपूर्णता का क्या होगा क्योंकि ये पूरा बुद्धि का दर्शन है इसको मॉडर्न फिलोसफी भी कह सकते हैं हम इसमें वो वो उनकी क्राइटेरिया है कि तो पूर्ण दर्शन वही दर्शन हो सकता है क्या मैं एक बूट पानी ले सकता हूँ आप लोग खुश हो गए आपको लगा खत्म हो गया है बस पानी पी रहा हूँ मैं बस दो तीन मिनट उठा लूंगा बस क्योंकि अकेले सत्ता और भाव कहने में ये दोष है फिर हमारी जो हमारा खुद का जीवन है हमारा एक हम में एक अपर्याप्तता है एंगजाइटी है चिंता है हमारा पूरा सृजन इस सब का क्या होगा तो अकेला ना भाव कह सकते हैं तो असल में वही है जब भी देखिए यहाँ पे वो पॉइंट आता है जहां पर सबसे ज्यादा मुश्किल उत्पन्न होती है मुझे भी कई वर्ष दस बारह साल लगे लगे इस पॉइंट को समझने में समझने में जब वो सल्ली जी ये कह रहे हैं कि असली जो विषय है वो भाव पे भावात्मक है इसका मतलब है जब हम जब हम जब हम जो हमारा जो प्रत्यंग जनरली वो कहते हैं कि दो तरह से चेतना के हो सकते हैं तो बाहर की तरह आनुभविक जगत में की तरफ जब हमारी इंद्रियां जाती हैं तो चेतना बाहर की तरफ जाती है बहर मुख हो सकती है या प्रत्यंग मुख हो सकती है इसका मतलब है कि बिल्कुल सेल्फ 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 सब्सिस्टेंस हम तुलना कर सकते हैं शल्य जी की कि उसी तरह से जब हम सेल्फ के सेल्फ के माध्यम से विषय को देखते हैं तो उनका एकदम बिल्कुल अलग पोजीशन है कि जो जो हम हम उस विषय से इस तरफ हटेंगे उससे अपना ट्रांसेंडेंस बनाएंगे उतना वो विषय स्पष्ट होता चला जाएगा इस तरह से वो विषय बिल्कुल और शुद्ध होता चला जाएगा ब्रह्म की तरह या जिस तरह से किसी भट्टाचार्य के लेवल की तरह धीरे धीरे वो शुद्ध होता चला जाएगा और एक घटना ये घटती है विषय के बारे में और दूसरा ये है ये मेरे दो तीन प्रपोजिशन और हैं ये इसके बाद में सब समाप्त कर रहा हूँ कि दूसरी बात क्या होती है कि इस तरह से जब हम विषय विषय को देखते हैं जब प्रत्येक मुख्य चेतन में तो न केवल विषय का जन्म होता है वहां पे एक कृत आत्मा का भी जन्म होता है दोनों एक साथ जन्म लेते हैं कैसे बिल्कुल ऐसा बिल्कुल नहीं है कि कौन किससे बड़ा है कि कोई छोटा है जिस तरह से हम पूरे सोचते चले आ रहे हैं तो वहां पर एक आत्मा का जन्म होता है वही आत्मा तरह 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 की सारी चीजों की सारे लोगों की रचना करती है आत्मा हमारी भाषा की रचना होती है हमारी संस्कृति हमारी कला की हमारे मूल्यों की मूल्य सबसे बड़ा सृजन है सल्य जी के अनुसार रचना के लिए तो इस तरह से सल्य जी में आप देखते हैं कि हमारी पूरा जो भी हमारा जीवन है उस सबकी व्याख्या हम सल्य जी के दर्शन में कर सकते हैं 
ये बहुत सारे था बहुत सारे आपके प्रश्न हो सकते हैं बहुत सारी अनक्लियरिटी भी हो सकती है लेकिन बाद में ये पेपर किसी को रुचि हो तो मैं उसको शेयर कर दूंगा आप इसको पूरा पढ़ सकते हैं थैंक यू वेरी मच आप कोई प्रश्न हो तो आप पूछ सकते हैं थैंक यू सर मे आई आस्क ए क्वेश्चन क्या मैं कोई प्रश्न कर सकता हूँ ओके ओके सर यू कैन थैंक टाइम फॉर बस छोटा सा सवाल सबसे पहले राजेश जी को बहुत बहुत बधाई कि उन्होंने पॉलिटिकल फ्रीडम का प्रश्न जो है उठाया और सारी परंपरा को एक ढंग से प्रश्नांकित किया क्योंकि जिस तरीके से हमारी औद्योगिक परंपरा का विकास हुआ है उसके साथ में जाति व्यवस्था कैसे हजारों साल से उसका औचित्य है ये समझना बहुत ही मुश्किल है और ये एक बहुत बड़े ढोंग को इसने फिलासफी में जन्म दिया है तो मेरा प्रश्न बहुत सीधा साधा है कि आपने अच्छे ढंग से शल्य जी को उठाया और इस बात को समझने की कोशिश की कि अगर जगत भी ब्रह्म है तो फिर हम हरी स्थिति क्या बनती है मेरा प्रश्न ये है कि अगर जगत ब्रह्म है तो फिर जगत को समझने की जो पद्धति है वही पद्धति ब्रह्म को समझने की क्यों नहीं हो सकती या जो ब्रह्म को समझने की पद्धति है वो जगत को समझने की पद्धति क्यों नहीं हो सकती मेरा इशारा इस तरफ है कि जिस तरह से हम मॉडर्न साइंटिफिक इन्वेस्टिगेशन में जगत को समझने की एक प्रणाली अपनाते हैं जिसको साइंटिफिक मेथड कहते हैं उसी तरीके से जिसको हम ब्रह्म कहते हैं उसको समझने के लिए ये ये डेफ्ट एपिस्टमोलॉजी ये अपरोक्षानुभूति इस तरीके की जो सब्जेक्टिविटी है जिसका कि कोई भी पब्लिकली टेस्टिंग नहीं हो सकती उसको क्यों स्वीकार कर लेते हैं धन्यवाद धन्यवाद आलोक टंडन जी आपने एक प्रश्न उठाया आ, लेकिन दरअसल जिस और आलोक टंडन जी का इशारा है वो ये है कि जैसे साइंस में जिस तरह से हम लोग अध्ययन कर रहे हैं जगत का तो जो जगत का अध्ययन करने की विधि साइंस क्यों है और जो हमारा जो बाकी पूरा पूरा मनुष्य हमारा मूल्य है इन सब की विधि अलग होगी ही क्योंकि देखिए केवल जो मनुष्य ही केवल जड़ नहीं है जड़ जगत को समझने की विधि बिल्कुल अलग ही होगी लेकिन मनुष्य ये जो आ, कला का आयाम है उसके मूल्य का आयाम है उसकी मुक्ति का आयाम है स्वतंत्रता का आयाम है इसके लिए निश्चित रूप से अलग विधि सब्जेक्टिव विधि होगी ही क्योंकि सब्जेक्ट को ही समझना है और वहां वस्तु को समझना है देखिए बिल्कुल अलग अलग चीजें हैं एक में क्या होता है कि अगर सब्जेक्टिविटी एक दोष होता है साइंस में आप सब्जेक्टिव वहां नहीं हो सकते केवल आपको केवल पूरी तरह से तथ्य को फैक्ट को समझना है लेकिन यहाँ क्या होता है कि यहाँ चूंकि सलीज भी कहते हैं कि आत्मा आत्मा स्वयं को समझना चाहता है मतलब हम आत्मचेतन होते हैं तो और आत्म चेतना के धरातल पे ही सारी चीजों का जन्म होता है चाहे वो भाषा हो चाहे कला हो चाहे संस्कृति हो चाहे हमारी सारी अच्छी अच्छी चीजें जो जगत में हैं, जिनके कारण हम कह सकते हैं कि हम मनुष्य हैं थैंक यू वेरी मच आलोक जी थैंक यू ओके लाइक टू आस्क क्वेश्चन कैन आफ्टर द लास्ट स्पीकर प्रेजेंट पेपर Now may I request Sir Rajivar Lochan to kindly come present the paper. Yeah. Excuse me, ma'am. To the time. At first, I convey my best regards to the head of the department and convener of this seminar, and honourable chairperson and respected professors, and my dear friends. i would like to a paper on the explorations of religious fanaticism and advaita vedanta as religion through the light of uh, dr sarvapalli radhakrishnan and swami vivekananda prospect vivekananda did you know that it is pursuit of reality and the formulation of religion advaita vedanta's philosophy is incredibly rich it is a classy framework of metaphysics ethics and religion the main contention of this paper is to establish that advaita vedanta is a scientific and moral religious 
without any fanaticism through the illustrious dictum of Sankaracharya, the ethical religious metaphysics of Radha Krishnans and the scientific religious approach of Vivekananda. Fanaticism is a doctrine of philosophy of religion which discusses about our belief or behavior that involves uncritical fashion. It comes to a central place in discussions of philosophical orientation, political orientation, religion that inspires religious extremism, which drives us to violence. Philosophers include Locke, Hume, and Kant endeavor to provide an account of fanaticism. They argue that fanaticism adds unwavering commitment to an ideal together with unwillingness to subject this idea to rational critic and the presumption of non-rational sanction for the ideal. Locke, Hume, and Kant offer philosophical analysis of fanaticism. It's a product of irrational commitment fostered by religious dogma. The excessive anthracism cultivated and promoted by religion could be reduced by the development of more rational approaches to meeting human needs. To see this, consider some characteristics accounts of fanaticism. Locke emphasizes the way in which the fanatic is impervious to rational argumentation. For Locke, the fanatic is person who presumes to have religiously sanctioned, unreading insight about some point. He cannot be reasoned with rational argumentation on dialogue is presumed insight. Hume takes the same point, same point, and it inspired person comes to regard himself as a distinguished favorite for the divinity. When this frenzy once takes place with takes place, which is the summit to enthusiasm, every wish me is con concentrated. Human reason and even rationality morality are rejected as fallacious guides. Kant complicates this standard account by introducing a distinction between mere enthusiasm and fanaticism. He writes, fanaticism must always be distinguished from enthusiasm. For Kant, enthusiasm is simply highlighted, excessive attachment. The enthusiast is inflamed beyond the appropriate degree. So the fanatic for Kant is enthusiastic, but takes this enthusiasm to be certified by some insight that is beyond the realm of rational inquiry. According to Radhakrishnan and Vivekananda, fanaticism and more specifically religious fanaticism is so dangerous for a just society that is God's beyond, God's against humanity. Here, humanity is here is a complex system. Humanity is called to spiritual ecstasy plus emotional euphoria. It is something called the reduction of external awareness and the expansion of inner awareness with inner feeling of well-being with happiness. Therefore, they emphasize universal religious, universal religion through universal oneness and interfaith dialogue. Interfaith dialogue, which can be calculated by a tool, tool called moral compass, moral compass and interreligious friendship. Both are Advaita Vedantins, and they stress on the teaching of method of Advaita Vedanta that is based on fundamental tenet called the, divide, the diversity in unity. Which means there might be many, many faces, but represent only one reality. According to Radha Krishnan's interfaith dialogue helps to interact between religious and spiritual groups. It, its main focus is to build a bridge among them. It is intentionally more inclusive in nature and it occur on multiple levels such as the individual level to the institutional level. 
the main purpose of this type of dialogue is to understand is to understand and respect the other individual or groups may have as they experience it it is the backbone of interreligious friendship it primarily arises on four levels knowledge action spirituality and morality while vivekananda argues vivekananda argues that universalism universalism is essential a creative religion a creative religious tolerance that accept all religions he claims that it is a proper way it is a proper way to widen our faith widen our faith which helps for the growth of religion it is the truth it is the truth of universal religion and truth ultimately lead to man's spiritual life but universal religion coordinate or unite varied sect of religion and declares that philosophy of religious philosophy of universal religion is based on the philosophy of humanism it is above the identity in and to difference religious universal religion most often it gets and every get to every individual the main aim of universal religion is just to teach us the knowledge the knowledge of the divinity of the soul the non duality of god head and the unity of existence and the harmony of all different religions according to radhakrishnan's ethical religious metaphysics the vedanta philosophy satisfy the demand of moral consciousness it is true it is true that vedanta doesn't contain an articulate code of morality right derived from an acknowledged ethical ideal the ethics of the vedanta is depends on its metaphysics according to vedanta metaphysics brahman is the sole reality and the individuals are all modifications of it the vedanta postulates the absolute oneness of all things the this metaphysical monism requires us to 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 look to look upon all creation as one open all thinking beings and the object of all thoughts is non different in morals the individual is enjoyed to cultivate a spirit of abheda abheda non difference thus the metaphysics of the vedanta naturally leads to the ethics of love and brotherhood every other individual is to regard as every your co equal and treats as end and non and not a mean the vedanta requires us respect human dignity and demands the recognition of man as man vivekananda in 1990 1893 in chicago he has emphasized on the validity and universality of all religion and he mentioned that every religion is able to create purity sacredness and kindness in human the mind so he accepted the validity of all religions in 1896 in the graduate philosophical society in harvard he declared or he declared that or he expounded his philosophical position that the mind moves from daitya and ends with adaitya and he believes in mind soul and god and their unity which has been discussed in his philosophy of yoga now come to he claims there there is a need there is a need for certain criteria to consider this that a religion such as form is firstly source of religions refers to scriptures of the religion that is essential to protect and preserve religion otherwise not possible secondly to make a religion is to worship oneness someone as a god or the world as a great teacher or need to believe in incarnation thirdly it consider that it is a religion is to be strong and sure of sure of itself and must believe that it alone is true otherwise it cannot influence people now the observation is that according to advaita vedanta the inner core of our being our life or our life of our life the soul of our soul is god is brahman according to radhakrishnans the ethical individual is guided by an intuitive initiate to move the world forward creatively challengingly convention and establish pattern of social interaction 
and he claims that it is integrated it's integrated mode of presenting a positive challenge positive challenge of moral dogmatism and this positive representation positive presentation of the moral convention creates promotion of social tolerance and accommodate accommodations but it rejects absolute claims to truth and validity of external authority but vivekananda claims that it is only one eternal religion which is a special which is with its capital r which is common to all humanity however however biogated follows from the various faith have seized upon only one and other aspect of it and started to claim is that the whole and the soul truth vivekananda the connected scientism and the belief in a kind in a kind of higher knowledge referring to sacred power sacred power which is unknown to mainstream science for him the yoga yoga is a magic magic seal according to raja yoga the external world is but the gross from the extra internal and subtle the man the man who has discovered and learned how to manipulate the internal force will get the whole of nature under the under his control the yogi possesses to himself no less a task than to master the whole universe to control the whole of nature i would conclude this point that there is no duality between brahman and brahmanda all reality and everything in the experienced world has its root in brahman which is unchanging consciousness these are also considered as absolute consciousness cosmic consciousness individual consciousness undwelling consciousness pure non irrational non intentional consciousness there is no good evil binary in advaita vedanta so it's free from fanaticism that is accepted by radha krishna and vivekananda thank you so much Uh, thank you, sir, Raziva Lochan. Um, um, I remember my cousin sister used to go to Switzerland, uh, I mean Geneva, just to just to present two minutes talk. So now we will take uh, questions. Yes, we will take uh, questions. And uh, why I'm saying is that uh, we request you both offline and offline to uh, give. If you have some constructive question, not not more than two sentences. Yeah, thank you. In some sense, I would be agreeing with you, but there is a problem about the language. The Universal religion is a technical term in philosophy of religion. What it means is that any religion which can permit from anybody from any other religion is called universal religion like Buddhism. Whereas Hinduism is not called universal religion because it may not accept Christians and, you know, Muslims and so on. So, when you call universal religion, Advaita universal religion, because you know there are thinkers who have used this expression, apparently what they mean is that this philosophy of Advaita can be practiced by any spiritual person, whosoever has soul or whosoever you would like to call a jiva he can practice Advaita philosophy and like Brahmin, so-called those who had Upanayana, thread ceremony, they were eligible for, of course, listening to Shruti and from Shruti they would learn about Atman and Brahman or Self and Brahman identity and then they reflect on those things Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana and so on, 
eventually they will be having Brahmanubhava and liberation. But this may not be allowed because of, again, rigid religious discrimination and so on. Not even women are allowed to listen to Sruti and non-Brahmins are definitely forbidden totally and so on. These complications are different, but in spirit what you are saying, I would like to agree with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. In this context, I would say, I will add one point is that the religion is called to truth, false, plus knowledge, plus assent, plus faith, and trust, trust. But we the people are starting from faith, as well, starting from trust and then faith. We are moving a reverse mode of thought. Our mind is moving a reverse way. Therefore, there is conflicts on a religion. If we start from truth and proceed to knowledge, knowledge to assent, access to trust, Ascent to faith, faith to start, automatically every obstacles, every doubt will be clear. And these two thinkers already provided that kind of tracking. That means how do you track your thought of religion? This is the, I found it's a right track. It's a right method. Can I, can I have one? Uh, like uh, mine is not for you, Professor. But no, I, one of the very, celebrated philosophers of our country, Professor Bhatt. Uh, Professor Bhatt, I would like to tell you uh, one thing. For the same reason for which uh, if Hinduism cannot be universal religion, Buddhism also cannot be universal religion. Second thing, the whole lot of, whole thing that you have told after this Upananam and all that is something which is superimposed by external forces on Indian culture, Indian uh, tradition, which is absolutely not there in our tradition. We have to, re, you know, there is a, a, like now this time is coming. Like I wanted to tell, Anand is there or not? No. Anyway, uh, you know, this is what we have been doing in Madras University. You both know, like very senior professors. But now only the people have started looking at it, how the tradition has been totally concocted to give a very different picture. I'm not telling that what has happened is wrong. I'm not telling. That is the, what you told that, I'm not telling there is no truth in it all, in this at all. But it has been created and we have to, it has been superimposed, created, and high time that we have to go out of it. Thank you. See you, sir. I think, he, uh, I, I think what sir told, we, Just, I will add then you. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, it is regarding this and it also refers to your paper. The Vivekananda's idea of a universal religion is not this, that if any practicing religion or any practice religion is elevated to the universal status of universal religion. He invented this new word to emphasize that Advaita or Vedanta in general can unite the whole universe, the whole humankind. And that will be the religion which doesn't negate any religion, but yet it reaffirms the essential truth of all religions. So if you have that kind of a universal religion, that will be a new religion. It cannot be either Buddhism or Hinduism. He was not doing uh, that kind of exercise. Thank you so okay. much, sir. Right. Just I want to, one, one half second, that what track I had provided here, like this, the truth, knowledge, asan, trust, path and trust, that means if you will strict in every compartment of this system, you cannot reach. Your target is to reach a religion. That means you have to determining anyone else, which is the master of this cosmos. You have to that you have to follow that liberal method. You have to be liberal. If each and every compartment should be liberal, that means should have some relation. You should not be strict in truth only. Then you are not doing the rest. You are losing or lacking the rest of the steps. You cannot. Yes, thank you. Sir. Um, thanks to all the uh, resource persons and then uh, thanks to all who had listened uh, patiently and also for those who had asked questions. We would like to give more time, but uh, as we are running short of time, we apologize for that. And now may I request uh, uh, Professor S.P. Pandey to kindly come and give the presidential remark.
थैंक यू फ्रेंड्स आई थिंक गुड चेयरपर्सन इज वन हु लिसन एवरी वन पेसेंसली बट साइलेंट बींग इन क्रिटिसिजम I thanks all the learned speakers for their good contribution, and even to the listeners and the commentator about the paper. Professor Shukla ji, Joshi ji, sorry, Das ji, Chaurasia ji, and my colleague Rajiv Lochan ji. but i will uh, talk about some observation regarding the title of this seminar and the papers which are presented now when we talk of post independence advaitic thinkers normally we should talk of the systems or the philosophers who philosophizes their views on the basis of the advaitic tradition since we know the foundations of advaita vedanta foundations of different systems the subject discussed in the philosophical system different philosophical systems that is okay why the problem are arises problem are, are problems are arises only that we don't consider the philosophical foundation of that system and we look the system from the another view or the from the view of from the eyes of another systems what are the philosophical foundations of advaita vedanta and what are the philosophical foundations of different systems of indian philosophies if we go on the foundation of that system and if we see any contradiction within the system that's the real criticism of that system otherwise from the buddhist view of view if we see the vedantic tradition or the other system of indian philosophies i think it is not just with that system so we should we should see the self contradiction within the system and that will be the honest criticism criticism of that system one thing and that will certainly contribute to the system and the thinking also since we have a possibility pass i have we have possibility of time session is already late because it was already started late train which comes on platform late normally we come late so uh, with this uh, some ignorance which i presented myself before you i thanks to all of you who participated in this semi in this session in the debates and for their valuable contribution thank you all again and again thank you इतना आवाज आ रही है मेरी now the next session is being started uh, good noon to all of you good noon to all of you i am kalpna yadav assistant professor 
in the department of philosophy and religion banaras hindu university and uh, in this session in this session we have four speakers and this session is being presided by uh, sir professor dk mohanta so first of all i would like to call upon all the dignitaries please come forward and take seat uh, professor dk mohanta sir professor daniel rave sir professor jata shankar sir dr niti singh and professor d n yadav sir uh now i request professor anand mishra sir to felicitate president of this session professor dk mohanta sir with shawl and flowers professor anand mishra sir now i request professor daniel rave sir to felicitate professor d n yadav sir thank you sir uh, now i request dr niti singh to felicitate uh, sir professor jeta shankar in this session we have four papers and the first paper will be presented by professor jata shankar sir uh, on the topic an introduction to alhabad schools of philosophy second paper will be presented by professor daniel rave on the topic making of contemporary advaita philosophy k c bhattacharya to ram chandra gandhi third paper will be presented by professor d n yadav sir on the topic professor sangam lal pande ki advait drishti and fourth paper will be presented by dr niti singh on the topic review of deaf epistemology in the light of professor sangam lal pande so first i would like to call upon sir professor jeta shankar for his talk please sir uh tell me in minutes all right uh, yes uh respected chairperson professor mohanta sir respected chair and 
co-speakers on the dais, my friends and philosophers from different parts of India and abroad, and dear students. The topic which I have given for today's talk is a an introduction to Allahabad School of Philosophy. See, the talks regarding different schools have started since beginning. Professor P. K. Mukhopadhyay, he mentioned, he referred Bengal School of Philosophy. On the similar line, I would like to introduce uh, Allahabad School of Philosophy, and actually this term was used by, uh, by my guide, Professor S. L. Pandey, uh, and in his mind, he had uh, like uh, Oxford School and uh, Cambridge School, so he termed Allahabad School of Philosophy in which Actually, he has written a very small book, uh, Problems of Depth Epistemology, in which he has uh, compiled four articles of four of his predecessors, P.S. Burrell, the first head of the Department of Philosophy, Professor R.D. Ranade, Professor A.C. Mukherjee, and Professor Aryan Kaur. And uh, along with that, he has uh, given a long introduction. And in his introduction, he has mentioned this term. Uh, these are the philosophers of Allahabad School of Philosophy. So this paper, it is not well written and well uh, organized paper that is why I could not send it properly uh, to be printed in that uh, souvenir. But in two parts, I will try to share something. One part is regarding those articles which have been mentioned uh, in this uh, school and especially in that uh, small book written by my Guruji, uh, Problems of Depth Epistemology. He classifies epistemology in two types. One is uh, surface epistemology, and the other is depth epistemology. And the need for depth epistemology is that, in spite of have diff in spite of having different theories of knowledge, some questions remain unresolved. There remains something which is not solved, either by idealism or by realism or by empiricism or by rationalism, pragmatism, etc. All these uh, systems fail to resolve certain questions and in order to reply those questions, he proposes depth epistemology. I will not uh, elaborate depth epistemology because uh, other speakers might be uh, doing on the same line, especially those who belong to Allahabad University. But uh, I will just name the articles. The title of the article by Professor P. S. Burrell was the, the criterion. He was not uh, an Indian professor, he was a Britisher. But he writes on the same line, taking something from Greek tradition and something from Indian tradition. The criterion. The second article by Professor R. D. Ranade. This is the doctrine of criteria. The third 
the third is by ac mukherjee on whom i i shall try to uh, say some more words in the next part that is the uh, foundations of knowledge he speaks of foundational knowledge and of course in which, in which he takes a twaita position especially of shankaracharya and the fourth article is by professor arun kaul and the title is coherence versus dialectic these are articles some of these articles i mean 1 3 and 4 sorry yes 1 3 and 4 were published in allahabad university studies a very reputed journal which was published very regularly in those days and the second article of professor r d rana day he has extracted professor pandey has extracted this uh, uh, article from vedanta the culmination of indian thought which was published by bharti vidya bhavan bombay in 1970 so the matter was collected from these areas but uh, ultimately he has given uh, ek sutrata he has tried to uh, formulate them on one line and about his own book he has written and while writing something on his own book he has uh, quoted a great nayayik shankar mishra who has said slaghas padam yadyapi netresham iyam kriti syadupahasa yogya this uh, uh, whatever i am writing it is not worth praise for others maybe people make fun of it but third and fourth line says tathapi shishyai guru gauravena even then my students those who honor me they will respect it and parasahasrai samupasaniya they will uh, honor my book therefore i am writing it so the purpose of the book was justified by uh, the great author the great advaitin was a great uh, scholar of advait vedanta now in the second part because i know the paucity of paucity and poverty of time and uh, i have read uh, uh, william shakespeare who says since brevity soul of wit i shall be brief so i will try to prove that i am a witty person <laughs> and therefore i shall be brief see uh, professor ac mukherjee's position i am going to discuss with you is based on his book uh, nature of self because this is a perpetual question who am i right now perhaps rajesh was referring to rajesh chaurasia ji he was referring to uh, ramana maharshi i have seen one of uh, his books uh, uh, in tamil it is a non yar and it was translated in english by professor t m p mahadevan and a pandit from kashi has translated it into hindi and i have edited and published published that hindi version uh, in my own sansthan uh, samaj dharma evam darshan i i regularly publish a, a journal from that sansthan for last 40 years and uh, i try to collect such materials so one is uh, uh, the same question arising in the upanishad sko hum who am i it is continuing till today 
and no final answer is available even now we are all trying to do uh, we are trying to solve it but uh, we are unable to do it because uh, uh, we don't have the method or even if we have we don't follow the method by which a transcendental reality transcendental truth can be comprehended professor mukherjee starts his uh, writing with three four uh, postulates he says that philosophy is search for ultimate truth secondly he says that this uh, this ultimate truth is beyond time and space and also categories third thing we uh, third uh, uh, statement which he, he has given as uh, his a uh, um, as a foundation says that uh, all philosophies whatever we have done and we are doing we do it uh, in time and space it is spatio speci temporal and also it is uh, confined to a system a particular system pranali hum kisi ne kisi paddhati mein bandh karke usko karte hain uh, since i am uh, adhyaksh of akhil bhartiya darshan parishad i will try to say few words in hindi also uh, because uh, that parishad is committed to to philosophy in hindi language so <laughs> i will try to mix up uh, not mix up i will try to mix hindi with uh, my presentation so so we are trying to know the uh, know that reality that truth which is beyond time and space through a tool which is uh, spatio temporal and this defect is this defect uh, causes unsuccess of our attempt we are we do not succeed in doing what we desire see so this is uh, how professor mukherjee proceeds and uh, then he discusses in detail a problem which he terms as egocentric paradox egocentric paradox a paradox which arises when we try to know the knower the atman uh, this uh, upanishad mantra was mentioned by some some of my speakers yesterday also atma vai are shrotabhyo mantabhyo nididhyas cha vyascha and en yena sarvavidam vijani tam tam kena vijani yat this kind of trouble even the rishi of upanishad had in his mind and that trouble is still uh, yes it is persisting and uh, to some extent it is growing today because rishis were uh, much ahead of our mind and our position anyway ha huh. so this problem arises because every object of knowledge presupposes some knower and then when we try to know the knower what what would be the position who would be the knower of the knower himself alternative may be another knower but this alter alternative will lead to infinite regress and another alternative may be that we put the knower as an object and then try to know but this also commits the fallacy of transcendental dislocation and the third alternative which has been mentioned by many scholars 
today and yesterday the kantian position that let us say that uh, it is unknowable but that position is not uh, even that position is not acceptable philosophically that cannot be accepted and that is not satisfying so this is uh, how professor mukherji has uh, he proceeded he says that there have been popularly two methods one is uh, he he terms it experimental method or inductive method inductive or uh, experimental method which is followed by uh, psychologists in their researches or as professor mukherji says the realist thinkers and he has specifically mentioned like nayikas in india and lock in britain they accept this position and the second method which is popularly known to us is a, he terms it as logical method or transcendental method in which the object is uh, uh, they try to know the object within the category or they try to know the object logically and this method is followed by uh, if i don't mention kant this is very much followed by neo hegelians like edward caird and t h green who disagree among themselves one goes with kant and accepts agnosticism and the other goes with uh, other rejects kantian position and accepts this fallacy fallacy of transcendental dislocation i don't have time to elaborate these uh, positions because uh, uh, my student neeti is on the dais she must remember that i taught this topic in 10 lectures in my classroom so how can i summarize in 10 10 or 15 minutes here so i will not try to elaborate it but one thing some things i would like to add that uh, hmm. in order to avoid these two undesirable positions transcendental dislocation on one hand and agnosticism on the other hand professor mukherji simply after saying that uh, on the same line on which adya shankaracharya uh, has uh, rejected so many positions in his uh, brahma sutra bhashya e parasparam viruddhyante ime parasparam viruddhyante vayam tu avirodhina so all these schemes all these systems they are opposed to each other and since we are avirodhavadi we don't believe in any kind of virodh how virodh is possible in advaita when there is a non dual transcendental reality and all pluralism and dualism is simply at empirical level maya janit so ime parasparam viruddhyante all they they are fighting with each other but we are avirodhavadi we are not opposed to anybody on the same line professor mukherji says that this uh, uh, the method which creates the fallacy of transcendental dislocation or the method which leads towards agnosticism they are paraspar virodhi they they are mutually contradictory and he takes a position which is a, the position of advaita vedanta 
uh, and that position, this word has also been mentioned many a times uh, during these two days. Aparokshanubhuti. This is the third proposed method which is adopted by Advaita Vedantins. And this can solve the issue, though it is not so easy. Many of my friends will raise many questions how this upper Okshanbhut can be accepted as a method. It has, it may have its own sufferings, but uh, Professor Mukherjee has accepted that this position actually is a successfully is a successful in avoiding the two un uh, two undesirable alternatives. And uh, he has uh, quoted several times, he has uh, uh, quoted uh, Upanishads. I once, uh, some months ago, I discussed with Professor Ambikadatta Sharmaji that I have got a Upanishad mantra from Keno Upanishad from where Professor Mukherjee had uh, extracted his uh, one sentence in English. He says that uh, uh, the ultimate truth is beyond the known and above the unknown. So it is neither known nor it is unknown. In popular sense, it is uh, neither known nor unknown. And this position is very beautifully uh, presented in Keno Upanishad, Khand Ek, first part, Mantra 3. I have uh, just written for, uh, for sharing it with you. Na tatra chakshur gachati, na vag gachati, no mano, na vidmo, na vijanimo, yathaitad anushishya danya deva. I have come to know this from the tradition. Etad eva tad, anyat eva tad viditat. It is other than the known. Anya deva tad viditat, atho aviditat adhi and aviditat adhi it is beyond the avidit the unknown so it is neither known nor unknown and uh, we know that uh, ultimate truth is uh, atman call it brahman or atman because they are there is advaita among the two and i'm sorry i am saying among the two there is nothing like two. So, actually, we have uh, uh, trouble of our linguistic limitations. Right now, a uh, paper was presented, very good paper was presented on universal religion. Universal religion. Had there not been used the term religion, much of the trouble would have disappeared. So, we have uh, a trouble of communication, medium of communication. But uh, Upanishad says in uh, its own language, Sanskrit, that it is anyat eva tat viditat atho aviditat adhi. So with these, uh, with these words, uh, and Professor Mukherjee has also quoted uh, where it is said that gyaptir tasya swarupam natato vyatirichyate. So gyapti, that knowledge is its nature. Neither it is knower nor known. So this position has been taken by Upanishads and that has been beautifully described by the great professor A.C. Mukherjee in his book, The Nature of Self. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And now the session is open for discussion. We can take only one or two questions. Please, sir, come. Uh, sir, we have money.
Uh, first of all, congratulations on such a lucid presentation, sir. Uh, my question is whether you mentioned some fallacies. So fallacy of transcendental location, fallacy of egocentrism. So I wonder whether they are fallacies. Because fallacy is a fault that we commit in making inference. Fallacy concept of fallacy is logical. When we violate the rule of inference, we are committing a logical fallacy. So I wonder whether this fallacy, for example, naturalistic fallacy, um, moves famous fall. Uh, so it is not a, a logical fallacy. So uh, what kind of fallacy is it? If at all it is a fallacy. Uh, uh, Professor Magale, he asked a question where there is a fallacy. What is the characteristic of a fallacious argument? Simply that uh, the inference is incorrect. The fallacy lies in this uh, decentralization in the same way as it lies in naturalistic fallacy. We try to use the tool of uh, one area in another area. And in this case, we uh, dislocate the center on the periphery in putting, in putting the knower as known object. We are committing the fallacy, committing the fallacy of decentralizing the knower. Uh, let us call it fallacy because uh, what Moore has said, uh, is it a fallacy? <laughs> Naturalistic fallacy is not a fallacy in strictly speaking. In the same way, it's popular that uh, fallacy of decentralization, this is a, and one thing more, nothing is illogical in philosophy therefore wherever we commit a mistake it's a fallacy <laughs> so really learned a lot about she you know usually there is a difference between method and content method and result in Advaita, like you are a great scholar of Advaita, so Sravana Manana Nididhyasana are taken as the means, method for Aparokhya Anubhuti. But uh, Professor Jatarji says Aparokhya Anubhuti itself is a method, right? But does it, either the word method has to be uh, in a, understood different way or Aparokhya Anubhuti has to be. Yes, uh, this is a debatable point, but when when one says that he is postgraduate, it means that he has done matric matriculation, then plus two, then graduation, then he is a. So this aparokshanubhut is the ultimate goal of certain methods, of not goal, culmination of these methods. So, Aparokshanubhuti uh, has been called as a method because it is culmination of methods. <laughs> that is that is what Professor Mukherjee has maintained in his in his book. Uh, no, but my position is not different. <laughs> Uh, guru Gauru, you know, he was guru of my gurus. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. So, one more question is being asked by Alok Tendon, sir. Sir, please. Alok Tendon, sir, are you there? Yeah. Uh, uh, my question is that this whole business of Aparashan Bhuti is very, very subjective. And this cannot stand the critical scrutiny of the scientific age. How can we say 
that this anubhuti is different from other anubhutis, mundane anubhutis. And if it is, why not call it a different mental state, not a evidence and proof of transcendental reality? We can accept that it is a sort of different mental state created by human being himself, within himself. But it does not show that there is some transcendental reality outside. Thank you. Uh, see, my friend Alok Tandon, when he asked a question on the paper of Rajesh Chaurasiyaji, I said sitting beside me that this question is a complex question. He has uh, presupposed that uh, there are two things. One is ultimate and the other is empirical. Whereas the position of Advaita Vedanta is that all is Brahma, Sarvam Kalvedam Brahma. So when we accept this position, then the question disappears, raised by uh, Professor Alokji, disappears. He is a, a very good friend of mine and uh, he cannot restrict himself from asking some or many questions. Uh, today we have lot of time, therefore he may ask only one question, otherwise he would have asked several questions on this topic. So I thank Alokji to make my talk uh, uh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, uh, I would like to call upon Professor Daniel Ravi, sir, for his presentation. Okay. Computer Wallace, can you put my paper on the screen? You. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to speak here again. Yesterday I said something on uh, Ram Chandra Gandhi. Today I will speak on Casey Bhattacharya. I was hoping that my paper can be screened because it, because I'm I'm going to quote from Casey Bhattacharya. And it would be would be easier to to follow. Um, Yeah, yeah, they are trying to, they are trying to do it. So again, I want to to thank my friend, uh, Professor Anna and Mishra, and uh, I'm very honored to to meet Professor D.K. Mohanta, who is a much greater expert than me on the writings of uh, K.C. Bhattacharya. So I will start, and let's see if if the text can appear before you all of a sudden. So I wrote a paper which I titled Kesi Bhattacharya, not only an Advaita thinker. It has two sections. The first section is on Advaita. The second section is on uh, Sankhya philosophy. Uh, I will only have time to read before you the first section, which suits the, the seminar Advaita Vedanta. So the first section is titled Writing in English. Writing in English, thinking through Sanskrit terms. Emmanuel Levinas, not there yet, Emmanuel Levinas constructed his theory of responsibility thinking through Hebrew words. Yeah, no, but now it has to cancel my, <laughs> cancel me and put the text uh, on full screen. Opposite. Yeah, we want the text. Yes, a, a, little, a, little, a little bigger even if possible. Can you? Can you make it a little bigger? Yes, okay. So, and, and, and someone will roll down as I speak, yes. Thank you so much. 
So again, I'm saying that Emmanuel Levinas constructed his theory of responsibility thinking through the Hebrew words achrayut, responsibility, and acher, other. The former, achrayut, is derived from the latter in the same way that responsibility in English is a matter of response to the other. The other faces me, Levinas writes, and puts me in question and obliges me. The face presents itself and demands, this sounds as if Casey Batachare wrote, it demands justice. This is from totality and infinity. In this case, etymology and ethics coincide. David Patterson explains that, I'm quoting, Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew was the first language that Levinas could read and write, with Hebrew as not only the language of his study, but as the first language of his literacy, it is not surprising to find that the holy tongue influenced the nature of Levinas's thinking. KCB, I will, I will, I will refer to Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya as KCB. KCB's Sanskrit background is highlighted by Gopinath Bhattacharya. His son and editor of, the collect, of his collected writings in his introduction to KCB's collected writings. He studied Sanskrit, Gopinath uh, tells us, <clears throat> from his grandfather, a Sanskrit scholar, I'm quoting Gopinath, trained in the indigenous seminaries of learning. It is therefore, apropos Patterson, not surprising to find that the holy tongue, in this case Sanskrit, influenced the nature of KCB's thinking. The place of Sanskrit in KCB's thinking and his sentiment toward, towards classical Sanskrit sources find expression in Swarajin ideas, his famous uh, lecture turned into essay from 1928 or 1929. So his sentiment towards Sanskrit find, finds expression in Swarajin ideas through the concept of the indigenous. I'm quoting, it is admitted today, KCB claims, what was not sufficiently recognized in the earlier days of our Western education, that we had an indigenous culture of high degree of development, the comparative value of which cannot be said to have been yet sufficiently appraised. Many of our educated men do not know and do not care to know this indigenous nature of ours. When they seek to know, they do not feel as they ought to feel that they are discovering their own self. The concept of the indigenous as used by KCB hints at the tradition texts that he imbibed at home and studied at the, president's, at the presidency college, Calcutta. KCB continues to comment on the English or European education that he and many others, quote unquote, our educated men, have received that, I'm quoting again, all concepts and ideas, even in the sciences, he stresses, have the distinctive character of the particular culture to which they belong. What would be our reaction to such cultural ideas? KCB asks his listeners at the Hoogley College. And in reply, he suggests that, again, I'm quoting, they have to be, yeah, it is before you. They have to be accepted, but metaphors and symbols to be translated into our own indigenous concepts. The ideas embodied in a foreign language are properly understood only when we can express them in our own way. I plead for a genuine translation of foreign ideas into our native ideas before we accept or reject them. Let us everywhere resolutely think in our own concepts. It is only thus that we can think productively on our own account. KCB's plea for translation from European or colonial terms into Indian or indigenous terms further echoes in A. Raghuram Raju's notion of calibrating Western philosophy for India. Calibrating Western philosophy for India, which is also the title of his two, 2019 book, in a nutshell, Raghuram Raju suggests that modern India is a mix of both the classical and the modern. Therefore, classical Indian theory, such as the political theory found in Kautilya's Arta Shastra, and Western theory, such as Marxism, are not sufficient if one aims to theorize the current Indian situation. 
This is the reason that Raghuram Raju thinks of the possibility of calibrating or bending, as he puts it, Western philosophy for India. At times, he explains, modern Indian philosophy leaned too much towards the West and neglected its roots. And the, on the other hand, those who chose to focus on Indian texts from the past found themselves isolated and risked being considered outdated. Therefore, Raghuram Raju aims to find another way, a middle way. But what about calibrating Indian philosophy for the West? He was asked when he visited Tel Aviv a few years ago. No, he answered that he was a no. The po post-colonial situation is one-sided. It is India which is in search of identity despite language, education, and philosophy imposed on it by the British colonizer. KCB explains in Swarajin ideas that his plea to resolutely think in our own concepts, in indigenous concepts, is a matter of finding the right distance from Western philosophy with its inbuilt foreignness and colonial fingerprints, distance that would enable him and others to assess Western ideas before accepting or rejecting them. But what about the distance needed for those rooted in classical Indian philosophy from their own tradition and roots in order to assess or reassess the ideas voiced in the tradition texts? The shackles of one's own tradition Rajendra Prasad argues in reply to KCB in his contribution to the special issue of the Indian Philosophical Quarterly on KCB's uh, Swarajian ideas from 1984 are as tight and constraining, often tighter and more constraining than the colonial otherness inscribed in Western philosophy. Any tradition, Prasad asserts, can dominate an individual and even an indigenous one can dominate him to the extent of destroying or, or, or very greatly weakening his judgmental decision-making ability, his ability to think freely, objectively, and dispassionately. In such a, if such a thing happens, it will not be less than annihilation or at least suppression of Swaraj in ideas. Prasad is hardly fascinated by the idea of the indigenous, even if KCB's concept of the indigenous is not pristine and acknowledges or even invites, quote unquote, assimilations. Prasad further argues that the indigenous traditions Bhattacharya wants us to revert are our ancient traditions, but the classical Hindu traditions do not constitute a, hom homo a homogeneous mass. And a reverential attitude is no guarantee that the traditions one reverse are all desirable. His conclusion is that, again I'm quoting, the chances of an indigenous tradition dominating one's thought and action patterns in a much more gripping manner, therefore, would be greater than those of an alien tradition. Kesi Bhattacharya's answer, if I may extract an answer from Swarajin ideas, would be that a pathological reversal ha has occurred, owing to which classical Indian philosoph philosophy feels foreign to the contemporary Indian intellectual, whereas she or he feels at home in Western philosophy. Prasad and Raghuram Raju are critical of any attempt to fall back on the past in the name of the present and the future. Prasad suggests that to replace Modernism with traditionalism and reverentialism is a grave mistake. Raghuram Raju agrees with him that the real clash is not between India and the West, but between the modern and the pre-modern or the classical. Prasad, sharp as ever, drives his point home. In a country open to the influence of an alien culture, he writes, one subjugation one subjugation to his own traditions may be treated by some as a safeguard Against his, against his possible subjugation by the former. One may feel tempted, like KCB, I'm adding, to believe that it will not let him be resubjugated by the alien cultures. This may be true, Prasad writes, but it is like the belief that a dead man cannot re-die. But it is not to be forgotten that the dead man certainly can stink. Resort to the tradition to, in, 
indigeneity as a remedy to westernization, Prasad sees as a morbid act. His, bo his bottom line reminds me of Vyas, the Yoga Sutra commentator, who suggests in his commentary to Sutra 215 that whoever thinks that the remedy for dukkha, suffering or evil, as KCB renders this fundamental term, evil is sukha anubhava, the experience of pleasure. Whoever thinks that the remedy for dukkha is sukha is all wrong. This is Vyas. Committing this mistake, Vyas suggests, is like running away from the sting of a, sting of a scorpion just to, get be, just to get bitten by a snake. A metaphor that works also for, for Prasad's critique of running away from colonialism to the bear hug of traditionalism. KCB's rendering of dukkha as evil in Pain as Evil, chapter one of his studies in Sankhya philosophy, is an example of, of a counter translation, not from European philosophy to our native ideas, but of, of an essential Sanskrit notion into Western terms and a Western discourse with, it, with its Judeo Christian the theological overtones. KCB's translation choice, evil, not as usual, suffering invites further reflection. My contention is that since colonialism is evil, and since the antonym of evil according to KCB, as he clarifies in the final sentence of his chapter, is not the good, but freedom. And since freedom for him is not just a metaphysical ideal, as in classical Sankhya, but also a political goal, I mean, the independence that he's dreaming of, but also a political goal, then if we read KCB's studies in Sankhya philosophy vis-a-vis -vis Swarajin ideas, it would not be far-fetched far -fetched to suggest that KCB, the translator, adds political overtones to classical Sankhya. By the way, uh, Swarajin ideas is not included in the collected writings of KCB Tacharya. I assume that his, his son and editor wanted to separate quote-unquote politics from quote-unquote uh, hardcore philosophy, but I'm not sure that, that, that this is, a, that this is a possible. Can we really do it? Is philosophy really a quote-unquote pure realm not to be tarnished by, by, by politics? I mean, politics of ideas. This is what KCB is discussing, the politics of ideas. Um, I'm writing, KCB brings a classical discourse, the Sankhya discourse, the Sankhya Karika. It is actually his Vashya to Sankhya Karika, verse one. So he brings a classical uh, discourse down to earth, uh, revealing its subtle political relevance. In this case, sorry, if this is the case, then Kaivalya, the Sankhya concept of freedom, can be rendered as independence, and more literally as referring to a partness and separation from the British rule, both external and internal. Colonialism operates from outside in, from political oppression to the occupation. Macaulay and KCB from both sides of the colonial border would agree of mind and soul. Freedom on the other hand, freedom on the other hand, from Sankhya philosophy to KCB's Swarajin ideas emanates from inside out. The final concept which I wish to examine here today, I mean, probably I already crossed the 15 minutes. The final uh, concept that I wish to examine here today under the rubric of writing in English, thinking through Sanskrit terms is KCB's Maha concept of the subject. My contention is that his concept of the subject is a melting pot of the Upanishadic Shankarite Atman with Kant and Hegel. As in the case of Dukkha is evil, KCB interweaves a pivotal Sanskrit notion with an essential European concept. For the Indian roots of KCB's concept of the subject, take for instance the following paragraph. Paragraph four, the notion of subjectivity of chapter one of the subject is freedom. So let's read together and I'll say a few words on this paragraph and I'll close. Um, object, I'm quoting, as symbolized by the word this, may be an individual object or a generality. The word I, as intending the subject, is not definitely either singular or general. It is indeed used 
to indicate not only one thing at a time, but a thing which cannot be indicated by more than one speaker. But then different speakers can be understood to use it. Each of, each of a distinct thing, namely himself, by the same hearer, and understood to use as he would use it. As used, the term has a uniquely singular reference. But as understood, it is, it is general in the sense that the term unique is, is general. This is a wonderful sentence. But, but as understood, it is general in the sense that the term unique is general. Shankara's Adhyasa Bhashya, that was mentioned here several times, echoes in this paragraph. Shankara's concepts of Vishaya and Vishayi, the object and the subject, the former manifested in the idea of you, the latter in the idea of I, and the discontent for the subject involved in their natural, naisargika, but erroneous intermixture, adhyasa, are at the core of captivity. Paragraph. The idea of a pure subject above and beyond everything object the shadi concept of but this does not just recap the long tradition of Indian thinking about the idea of an objectless subject. A master of words general overtones of the word unique. He made distinction between use singular, general, but unless there is a sense of misomership in the generality of the word unique. It feels what feels counterintuitive meaning. This counterintuitiveness also applies to the concept of subjectivity in KCB's this Jacks life into the old concept of the Atman. The linguistic illustration that KCB comes up with the term unique in general gives a glimpse into the intricacy of the experience of subjectivity. The general above and beyond stands on the shoulders of my singular embodied experience here and now. If the singular meaning of, a word, of the word unique cannot be dispo disposed of, even when we speak of the term in general, how does it project on the place of singularity in the everything but singular Advaitic experience of the Atman. This is, this is yet another articulation of a pertinent point developed by KCB in his essay, Shankara's Doctrine of Maya, which he has read in the first meeting of the Indian Philosophical Congress in 1925. In this, in this essay, this is my last paragraph, don't worry. In this essay, KCB focuses on what he refers to as the third stage of the snake. In the previous two stages discussed time and again, I mean, you know the parable about the, the, the Raju and the Sarpa, the, the rope and the snake. In the, in, the, in the previous two stages discussed time and again, both traditionally and contemporarily, the snake is perceived first as real, then as unreal namely first as a snake and then as a rope. But what happens next? For Shankara, see Brahma Sutra Bhashya 146, there is no next. When you realize that the snake is in fact a rope, this is the moment of spiritual awakening. Both anxiety and conceptual error come to their mutual end. But according to KCB, though corrected, the snake is not forgotten. Like the individual self, the snake that was not really there at any point of time is still, I'm quoting him, felt to be given, responded, responded to, and even perceived in absolute mockery of thought, even after its correction. As an Advaita commentator, and I think that what I'm saying here co connects to my previous uh, talks in this department about newness and philosophy, newness in philosophy. As an Advaita commentator, KCB uses the third stage of the snake in which it neither exists nor do not exist to rethink Shankara's notion of Maya. But the point that I wish to make here is that the third stage of the snake also enables KCB to touch on what he sees as the crux of the, mat of the matter. Namely, I'm quoting him for the last time, the hidden subjective defect through which the snake 
is still given, unquote. A philosopher through and through, KCB is interested in the mechanism of the human gaze, in the materials which constitute the gaze, and in borderline situations in which we do, we do not see what we are, quote unquote, supposed to see, and do not feel or experience what we are, again, quote unquote, supposed, supposed to feel. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. स्वराज इन आइडियाज के जिस लेख का जिक्र किया है उसके ऊपर इंडियन फिलोसॉफिकल क्वार्टरली में भारतीय स्वतंत्रता के 50 वर्ष होने के उपलक्ष में एक विशेष अंक निकला था तो उसमें धर्मेंद्र गोयल ने भी एक लिखा था जिसका जिक्र आपने नहीं किया है और धर्मेंद्र गोयल इस दिखाते हैं कि कैसे हिंद स्वराज ये जो स्वराज इन आइडियाज इस लेख में केसी भट्टाचार्य ने जाति व्यवस्था का समर्थन किया है तो ये जो हिंद स्वराज जिस स्वराज की बात कर रहे हैं वो सार्वभौमिक स्वराज नहीं है ये केवल जो हेजमेनिक फोर्सेस है सोशल फोर्सेस है भारत के उनकी स्वतंत्रता की बात कर रहे हैं और जब आप उपनिवेश की बात करते हैं उपनिवेश विरोध में कोई दिक्कत नहीं है लेकिन जो आंतरिक उपनिवेश है यहां की जो जातिवादी ब्राह्मणवादी व्यवस्था के जो शिकार है उनकी मुक्ति का प्रश्न क्यों नहीं मुक्ति का प्रश्न बनता है क्यों महत्वपूर्ण नहीं है तो मेरा आई एम गोइंग टू मेक अनुप्लोरेट कमेंट एंड आई एम पुटिंग दिस क्वेश्चन टू ऑल ऑफ द वेदांत तो मेरा ये मेरा यह मेरी स्थापना है मेरी ये समझदारी है कि ये जो जाति व्यवस्था का समर्थन है ब्राह्मणवाद का समर्थन है यह पूरे वेदांत की योजना का भाग है जब आप शंकर भाष्य शारीरिक भाष्य पढ़ते हैं तो पहला ही प्रकरण है अपशुद्र अधिकरणम कि शुद्र क्यों वेदांत का अधिकारी नहीं है तो उसके लिए वो कहते हैं कि जिसको उपनयन का संस्कार है अधिकार है वही वेदांत का अधिकारी हो अधिकारी अधिकारिणी हो सकती है लेकिन चूंकि शुद्र को यह अधिकार नहीं है इसलिए और उसके समर्थन में वो फिर श्रुति को भूल के स्मृति को कोट करते हैं मनुस्मृति को कोट करते हैं कि जो शूद्र है इट इज लाइक अ वॉकिंग कैरियन एक चलता हुआ लाश है अशुद्ध है इसीलिए यदि ऐसे शूद्र के कान में वेद का शब्द पड़ता है तो उसके इसमें पिघला हुआ गर्म शीशा डाल देना चाहिए दिस इज This is written in शारीरिक भाष्य You have to read it. तो ये मेरा ये कहना है कि जो उनकी metaphysical ontology है उसी से उनकी social ontology निकलती है सामाजिक सक... क्योंकि जो metaphysical ontology है जो टाइप्रेटाइट division of reality है वो वही सामाजिक सोशल ऑन्टोलॉजी में सामाजिक सत्ता से मैं समय निकलती है तो ये जो बात करना कि सर्व सर्व खलु ब्रह्म सब कुछ ब्रह्म है लेकिन आप व्यवहार में पूरी जाति व्यवस्था का अस्पृश्यता का और इसी छांदव के उपनिषद में एक कथा आती है रैक्व की कथा जनश्रुति एक व्यापारी है जो अपने दान प्रवृत्ति के लिए जाना जाता है तो एक बार ऐसा होता है कि दो पक्षियों को कहते हुए सुनता है कि रैक नामक जो ऋषि है वो तुमसे ज्यादा प्रसिद्ध है तो जनश्रुति रैक के पास जाते हैं कि मेरा पूरा धन ले लो और यस यस यू मस्ट लिसन टू मी नो नो इट्स ओके लेट्स लेट्स गिव हिम टू मोर से देन आई वांट टू से समथिंग इन रिप्लाई डोंट डोंट इंटरव्यू 
कल से आप लोग इसे क्योंकि भारतीय संस्कृति में ये कह रहे हैं कि भारत की संस्कृति को प्रभावित कहा है कहा समानता है आपकी संस्कृति में लेडी नो तो ना तो ये ये भी आपके साहित्य में ना इसको भी सामने आना चाहिए तो जन तो जनश्रुति कहते हैं कि हाँ ये सौ घोड़े ले लो इतना धन ले लो रायक कहता है कि नहीं फिर अंत में जब जनश्रुति उनको अपनी लड़की देते हैं तब रायक तैयार हो जाते हैं तो और कहते हैं कि शूद्र है होने के बावजूद तुम्हारी लड़की इतनी सुंदर है इसलिए मैं तुमको ज्ञान देने को तैयार होता हूं तो इसकी व्याख्या करते हुए शंकर ने कहा है कि यहाँ पे शूद्र का मतलब जो है वो दुख से है जिसके मन में दुखी है तो इसलिए वो मतलब उनके लिए श्रुति जहां पर उनके उनके पॉलिटिकल प्रोजेक्ट में वो रास्ता खड़ा करती है तो वो फिर स्मृति की तरफ चले जाते हैं मेरा यही कहना है I want to say that I mean, I understand that that we are responding to the the political aspect of 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 what I read, but I want to 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 suggest that I was putting my focus on the notion of translation. Question is what what are we supposed to do with classic Indian texts? Definitely, according to Kesi Bhattacharya, we are not supposed to to take the texts and and leave them. We are supposed to do something new and creative. Apropos the notion of Swaraj with this. With these texts, so when I when I listened to, I was thinking about the notion of aparushya, aparushya tva. So aparushya, I mean, all of you know better than me what what's the meaning of aparushya when we speak of the Veda, that it was not composed by any person because any every person, even even the gods, have shortcomings, and the text is supposed to be a perfect text. But can we think, Bagresab, of aparushya tva as a text which is which is composed? Not by a single person, but 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 as a collective, as a collective text, text which which is which is composed by by all of us together. Think, for example, about the Indian Constitution as aparushyatva. What would you, what would you say about about this new new interpretation, classical text such as aparushyatva? Uh, thank you. I didn't want to say anything. आ, लेकिन हमारे मित्र प्रमोद कुमार बागड़े जी ने जो बात कही उसके लिए मुझे लगा कि दो तीन लाइनें मुझे बोलना चाहिए आ, अधिक तो नहीं क्योंकि ये उस पर अधिक बोलने का मतलब ये होगा कि पूरा का पूरा विषय ही शिफ्ट कर देना उसके लिए कभी अलग बात की जा सकती है आ, दो बात थी एक तो अपशुद्राधिकरण की बात की गई और दूसरा जो रैक के बारे में बताया गया ये बड़ी मजेदार बात है कि रैक को जो कि एक राजा था जब पहुंचता है जानश्रुति तो उसको शूद्र करके संबोधित करते हैं और शूद्र करके संबोधित करते हैं तो उसका तात्पर्य है और ये जो अपशूद्राधिकरण में भी अगर आप देखेंगे शूद्र शब्द के बारे में वहां पर भी वो शुच्छ धातु का प्रयोग उससे शूद्र शब्द की वित्पत्ति के बारे में वहां पर भी बताया गया जब बात की जाती है अधिकारी की बात जो सबसे प्रॉब्लमेटिक पॉइंट है वेदांत विद्या में अधिकारी उस अधिकारी के बारे में वेदांत सार को पढ़ने वाले सारे लोग उसको उससे परिचित हैं हम सब में से कोई भी व्यक्ति उसको पढ़ने के लिए अधिकारी नहीं हो चाहे वो ब्राह्मण कुल में जन्म लिया हो चाहे जिस कुल में जन्म लिया हो हम सब में से कोई भी उसके लिए अधिकारी नहीं है तो अधिकारी के बाद अगर हम करने की बात कर रहे हैं तो उस अधिकारी में हम कोई भी किसी की भी क्षमता नहीं है कि अधिकारी बन सकता हो तो केवल शूद्र की बात वहां पर नहीं आ रही है और ये जो विरोधाभास है उस विरोधाभास को प्रैक्टिकल वेदांत में विवेकानंद ने देखने की कोशिश की कि ये जो समस्या है और जिस समस्या को आप उठाना चाह रहे हैं हमारी प्रॉब्लम क्या है कि हम अपने पास्ट को गुस्से की नजरिए से भी देख सकते हैं लेकिन समस्या यह है कि उस पास्ट पर गुस्सा करके भी हम कुछ नहीं कर सकते पास्ट को हम देखते समय क्योंकि जब हम तुलसीदास को देखें कि उन्होंने कितनी महिलाओं की निंदा की लेकिन कभी भी कबीर दास के बारे में हम नहीं सोचते हैं कि महिलाओं की कितनी निंदा उन्होंने की है क्योंकि कबीर दास के बारे में वो चर्चा करने से हमारा पूरा नहीं होता है क्योंकि कबीर दास किसी ब्राह्मण कुल से नहीं आते हैं या किसी ऐसे कुल से नहीं आते और उनके बारे में जब हम बात करेंगे जबकि कबीर दास की चिंतन में महिलाओं की निंदा जितनी है उससे कम ही आपको तुलसीदास के चिंतन में दिखाई पड़ेगी मतलब मुद्दा यह है कि हम इन चीजों को ये असल में 
ऐसा क्यों है कि कबीरदास और तुलसीदास एक ही काल में होते हुए इस तरीके से एक ही प्रकार से सोच रहे हैं वो इसलिए सोच रहे हैं क्योंकि वो एक सामान्य जन भावना उस तरह की बनी हुई है तो हमारा कार्य यह है कि वह अगर कुछ ऐसा पास्ट में हमारा रहा है तो उसको हम बदलने का प्रयास करें भविष्य को हम बेहतर बनाने का प्रयास करें और उससे बाहर अपने आप को निकले और हम उस पास्ट के प्रति गुस्सा रख करके हम स्वयं का भी अपना भी नुकसान करेंगे और हमारी जो जनता है जो हमारे विद्यार्थी हैं इनको भी हम सही मार्गदर्शन नहीं प्रदान करेंगे मैं अप विनम्रता के साथ केवल इतना कहना चाहता हूं धन्यवाद आ, अब मैं तीसरे पेपर के लिए प्रोफेसर डी एन यादव सर को आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगी सर आइए थैंक यू रिस्पेक्ट हेड ए क्वेश्चन रिजल्ट अलाउ मी ओके बोला। I raised my hand to ask a question. Question to me. <laughs> to Ravi. Respected chair. Okay. And uh, very senior scholarly professors, professor like professor Prasad, Arshankar Prasad ji, professor Arshi. प्रधान सर प्रोफेसर भट्ट सर एंड प्रोफेसर गोदारिस मेंबर सेक्रेटरी प्रोफेसर सचिदानंद मिश्रा जी नॉट टू फॉरगेट डॉक्टर संजय कुमार जी और अदर लर्नेड ऑडियंस इंक्लूडिंग प्रिय विद्यार्थियों एंड माय टीचर प्रोफेसर जटा शंकर तिवारी सर द टॉपिक हिच आई एम गोइंग दैट इज नॉट अ सीरियस टॉपिक फॉर मी आई डो दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक बिकॉज आई हैव कम इन दिस सेशन बाय द टेक्नोलॉजी मतलब क्या जुगाड़ टेक्नोलॉजी टू द एडजस्टमेंट फॉर दिस आई वुड आई मस्ट थैंक प्रोफेसर आनंद मिश्रा जी for giving me the space in this uh uh quality uh, of time otherwise he has put me for tomorrow so thank you and thank for it also you have given me the chance to speak to something to speak something ab jante hain main hindi mein bolunga ki main ilahabad vishwavidyalay ka vidyarthi raha hu मेरा सौभाग्य है कि मेरे गुरुवर सर जटा शंकर सर यहाँ बैठे हैं दूसरी एक विचित्र या बड़ी अच्छी बात भी है कि तीन पीढ़ियों से तीसरी पीढ़ी से मैं जुड़ा हुआ हूँ एक प्रसव संगल पांडे जी जिनके ऊपर मैं कुछ बोलूंगा बहुत ज्यादा बोलने के लिए मैं कई सालों तक तो पढ़ना पड़ेगा मैंने बहुत मतलब अटेंडम थोड़ा बहुत कुछ कर लिया है और उनके जो शिष्य रहे हैं प्रसर द्विवेदी सर सर रामलाल सिंह जी और भी कुछ लोग और कुछ लोग और उनका भी मैं स्टूडेंट रहा हूँ और प्रसर जटाशंकर सर प्रसाद शंकर पांडे जी के शिष्य रहे हैं प्रसर द्विवेदी और प्रसाद राम जी शिष्य रहे हैं मैं आपका भी शिष्य रहा हूँ इस तरह से मेरा सौभाग्य है कि तीन पीढ़ियों से मैं जुड़ा हूँ और सर को मैं समर्पित करते हुए थोड़ी थोड़ी बातें कहूँगा नीति भी परेशान हो रही थी कि सब सर बोल देंगे तो हम क्या बोलेंगे नहीं नहीं मतलब आल दो इज वेरी ब्रिलियंट स्टूडेंट ऑफ माय डिपार्टमेंट लेकिन सर ने पहले ही कह दिया मैं बहुत थोड़ा थोड़ा बोलूंगा आप लोग परेशान मत हो तो मैंने कहा सर मैं थोड़ा सा आहार ज्ञान पर बोलना चाहता हूँ तो संजोग से आपने नाम ही नहीं लिया इतनी बड़ी कृपा की तो बहुत ज्यादा नहीं समय लूंगा क्योंकि समय बहुत कम है पांडे जी का पांडे जी को 
जब पढ़ते हैं तो मुझे लगता है बहुत पढ़ने की जरूरत है जब हम लोगों को क्लास लेते थे बहुत से तमाम ऐसे दृष्टांत हैं मैं थोड़ा बहुत बोल करके आगे बोलूंगा कि एक चीज मैं कहना बागड़े साहब को मैं कहना चाहूंगा और सब पांडे जी को बड़ा मिस इंटरप्रेट किया जाता था स्वभावता होता है कोई ब्राह्मण है तो ब्राह्मणवादी होगा मैं सबके विषय में ये समस्या है और बागड़े जी जो कहा मैं ये भी मानता हूं मैं स्वीकार करता हूं कि इस पॉइंट को उठाया जाना चाहिए अलग सेशन में पूरे खुले मन से इस पर चर्चा करनी चाहिए गुस्से में नहीं सबकी बात सुनना चाहिए सहिष्ठता के साथ सुनने वाला भी सहिष्ठ हो धैर्य हो और कहने वाला भी धैर्य से बात करे भाषा तो भाषा है चाहे जोरों से कहिए चाहे पोलाइटली कहिए यह बहुत बड़ी बात उन्होंने कहा है और उनका स्वागत है लेकिन उसके लिए अलग सत्र में अब बहुत बल्कि छांट छांट कर जो बहुत पेशेंस वाले हों उनको बैठाया जाए तब उस पर चर्चा हो तो पांडे सर के तमाम दृष्टांत है एक तो जैसे मैंने कहा बात की मैंने महसूस किया उनके ऊपर आरोप लगता था पुत्रवाद की बात तो मैं भी अपने बेटे को बहुत चाहता हूँ सभी लोग चाहते हैं उस पर मैं नहीं बोलूंगा ब्राह्मणवाद तो मैं बता दू मैंने नजदीक से देखा है कि उनमें इंटेलेक्चुअल एकेडमिक कुछता का भाव रहता था सुप्रियार्टी का लेकिन कास्ट की सुप्रियार्टी नहीं थी सर बैठे हैं जानते होंगे और मैंने महसूस किया है दूसरी बात कि कुछ चीजें इतनी बढ़िया बढ़िया कहते थे कि भाई देखो मैं कहता हूँ समय नहीं मिल रहा मैं ट्यूशन पढ़ाता हूँ कुछ नहीं ट्यूशन पढ़ाते ही दस मिनट निकाल के जब टाइम मिला तो तुम सोच लिया करो एक बात कहते आप हंसेंगे कि देखो बाथरूम में जाओ तो बड़े अच्छे विचार आते हैं वहां भी सोचो टाइम मिल जाए तो उन्होंने कहा कि तुम ये बताओ कुछ हम बेसी के छात्र रहे उसके बाद में गया तो तुम साइंस पढ़े हो तुम बता दो कुछ वैज्ञानिकों का नाम जो बहुत बढ़िया से बैठ करके विचार दिए हैं कल बताना दो चार दिन बाद तुमने कहा सर इट इज नॉट पॉसिबल टू नेम मोस्ट ऑफ द साइंटिस्ट दो चार हम सोचे हैं कह बताओ तुमने कहा आर्कमिडीज को मैंने सोचा है क्या किया नहाते नहाते उसको बिछा आ गया यूरेका और कहता बताओ वो क्या पढ़ा था बैठ कर पानी में नहा रहा है उसने इतनी बड़ी बात कही न्यूटन जाए थे बैठे हुए थे कहीं पर जंगल में शेर गिर गया क्या उसके पहले नहीं शेर गिरता तो से नीचे गिरता था क्या वो विधवत प्लान के साथ पढ़े लिखे थे क्या और कौन है एक जो क्या कहते हैं वो जो रेल इंजन बनाया था भाप इंजन है जेम्स वाक और तमाम और बोल्टा मीटर का जो प्रोजेक्शन की खोज किया था ग्यारह ग्यारह साल तक ग्यारह साल पढ़े तो उनको समझ नहीं आई कहीं सो रहे थे इसे फेंक दिया तो उसमें प्रोजेक्शन हो गया तो ना जान गया कहने का मतलब ये था कि उनकी प्रणाली जो जीवन जीने की पढ़ाने की हर क्षण सीख सकते हो दूसरी बात जो हमारी व्यवहार किया कि मनुष्य को कभी भी ये नहीं मानना चाहिए कि हमारी इतनी उम्र है नहीं तो कुछ करोगे नहीं ये मान के चलो कि हम अमर हैं नहीं तो कहो पेड़ लगाओ कहकर हम तो खाएंगे नहीं पेड़ क्यों लगाए हम तो दस दस पंद्रह बीस साल जियेंगे तो बहुत सी विशेषताएं थी और डाउन स्टूडेंट मैंने बहुत जमीन से जुड़ करके आए थे उनके जीवन के विषय में मैं बहुत नहीं कहना चाहूंगा समय नहीं है लेकिन सेल्फ मेड आदमी थे उनसे सीखने को हमें मिलता था मैं ट्यूशन पढ़ाता था छिपाता था तो उनको जब पता लगा तो बुला को उन्होंने कहा कि तुम तो बहुत बड़ा बहुत बहादुर आदमी हो कहने का मतलब कि जमीन से जुड़ी चीजों को रिक्शे वाले से बात करते थे उससे भी सीखो हर नीचे के आदमी से बात करो उससे सीखो तो यह उनके जो एनालिटिकल प्रवृत्ति थी वह हम लोगों को बहुत सीख प्रदान की और उनका जो प्रयास था काम करने का ये बहुत लंबा चम्बा है उस पर मैं बहुत नहीं कहूंगा और थोड़ा बहुत बोलते हुए मैं थोड़ी सी बात कहूंगा केवल कि जो उनके तमाम पांडे जी के अध्ययन पांडे के अनुसार का लेखन रहा है ये तमाम उन्होंने काम किया हिंदी अंग्रेजी संस्कृत है दूसरा उनका योगदान रहा कि और भी लोग रहे होंगे लेकिन मैं मानता हूं कि उत्तर भारत में दर्शन शास्त्र को हिंदी में लाने को मैं लगता हूं कि उनका सबसे ज्यादा उनको श्रेय जाता है और वो कहते भी थे कि देखो मैं तो ठीक है पढ़ रहा हूं संस्कृत पढ़े थे जानते थे हिंदी में संस्कृत अंग्रेजी में तीनों में समान अधिकार था हम लोगों को हिंदी में प्रोत्साहन देते थे मुझे उन्होंने हेगल की किताब है उस हेगल की जो बुक है उसका नाम नहीं याद आ रहा इस पर आप केवल ट्रांसलेशन कर दो इसी पीएचडी दे देंगे थी बड़ा मुश्किल है सर और बार बार कहते थे कि हिंदी में लिखो हिंदी में लिखो उनकी वो थी तो बल्कि 
कहते थे तीनों में लिखो तो हमने कहा सर किसी तरह से हिंदी में बोल सकते हैं कुछ अंग्रेजी सीख रहे हैं संस्कृत तो नहीं आती है लेकिन उन्होंने जो मल्टी डायमेंशनल जो उनका काम था जैसे तमाम उन्होंने उस पर काम किया जो दार्शिक तरवासी शुरू किया अखिल भारतीय दर्शन परिषद शुरू किया आप जानते हैं सभी लोग जो उत्तर भारत दर्शन परिषद के जो आज दर्शन परिषद के नाम से चल रहा है इस प्रकार संगम पांडे जी की रचना धर्मता प्रयोग धर्मता दर्शन में एक लंबी सेवा की है और जीवन भर अद्वैतवादी रहे मैंने कहा ना कि जब नजदीक रहित जो रहा है उनको वही उनको समझ सकता है मैं क्यों ब्राह्मणवाद जातवाद की बात करूं मैंने नजदीक से देखा ये प्राय आरोप लगता है आज भी है और है भी समाज में मैं भी मानता हूं ऐसा नहीं है तो वह इस तरह के क्रिटिकल आदमी थे और बहुत सी चीजें उन्होंने अपना काम किया जैसे माधवाचार्य के सदर्शन संग्रह मसों शस्त्री के प्रस्थान भेद में सभी दर्शनों का संबंध अद्वैतवाद में उन्होंने किया अपने लेखन में पांडे ने अद्वैत वेदांस की श्रेष्ठा को उजागर किया है और बाद में जानते हैं कि तीस जून दो को उन्होंने अपनी सांसें ली और मेरा उनसे कुछ पता नहीं गॉड गिफ्टेड था इतना ऐसा संजोग था कि हर विशेष अवसर पर उनके यहाँ आ जाता था जिस दिन उनकी डेथ हुई मैं सुबह सुबह पहुंचाया घर पर उनके तब आकर जाना कि अभी सुबह उनकी डेथ हुई है और उनके तमाम जैसे अद्वैत विवाह गार्ड है तो अद्वैत की जो आ, उनकी परंपरा है हमने ट्राफिक का नाम जो है प्रसाद संगल पांडे का अद्वैत दृष्टि जरूर दिया है उस टॉपिक के हिसाब से देखता बहुत बुरा टॉपिक है लेकिन मैं कुछ चीजें कौन लूंगा कुछ उन्होंने जो काम किया है जो इसमें मुख्य रूप से उनका ये है उससे इसमें केवल एक दो कॉन्सेप्ट लेना चाहता हूं वह कॉन्सेप्ट है आहार ज्ञान का कई बहुत महत्वपूर्ण चीजें हैं जो यहाँ पर मैं कोट कर रहा हूं लेकिन मैं सबको नहीं लूंगा पांडे जी की नूतन जो उद्भावना है जो अद्वैत वेदांत की छाप स्पष्ट देखी जा सकती है लेकिन उससे समझने की दृष्टि होगी हमको भी दृष्टि डेवलप करना पड़ेगा उनके साहित्य को पढ़ करके तब हम ही डेवलप होगा एकाएक हम अगर पढ़ेंगे तो हम जो परंपरागत हमारी दृष्टि है या जो परंपरागत सिद्धांत है अद्वैत वेदांत के उस फ्रेमवर्क में हम देख पाएंगे तो नहीं समझ पाएंगे जब तक कि उनकी पृष्ठभूमि के उनके सारे लिटरेचर को या अधिकांश लिटरेचर को नहीं पढ़ पाएंगे तब तक हम उनके उन नए कॉन्सेप्ट को नूतन जो कॉन्सेप्ट है जो नवीन जो न्यू कॉन्सेप्ट उन्होंने दिया है अद्वैत वेदांत का जो प्रभाव स्पष्ट देखा जाता है उसमें देखिए एक नंबर है व्यवहारे तू भट्ट नयस के स्थान पर व्यवहार तू गांधी नया मैं इसको व्याख्या करने की स्थिति में नहीं हूँ न तो उतना समय है न तो उतना हमने पढ़ा है नेत नेत के मूल में इत इत की स्थिति मैं प्रसंग एक रेफरेंस के तौर पर दे रहा हूँ माया का तार्किक संभावना के रूप में वर्णन किया उन्होंने आहार ज्ञान का सिद्धांत इस पर मैं थोड़ा बोलूंगा स्फोटवाद से अद्वैतवाद का अविरोध है अविरोध जो विरोध किया जाता है मतलब मैं मानता हूं कि इवस फंड ऑफ कहे कि कंपेयरिंग द अनकंपेयर मतलब उनकी शौक थी कि जहां पर कोई कंपेरिजन नहीं हो सकता है वहां भी कंपेरिजन निकाल सकते थे या निकालने की प्रवृत्ति उसमें कुछ करो उसी का परिणाम है मैं समझता हूँ आहार गान का कंसेप्ट उनका बाद में मैं सिर्फ प्रभावित होकर उस पर मैंने रिसर्च भी कराया है यदि भी कराया कई लोग कहते हैं कि ये कौन सा टॉपिक होता है वेदांत में भक्ति या अद्वैत वेदांत भक्ति मैंने कराया पूरा भी कराया इससे बहुत प्रभावित हुआ इनसे मैंने मेटल लिया उस समय मेरे सिस्टम था इनसे मैंने काफी मतलब सीखा कि सर इसको कैसे कराओ मैंने तो दे दिया तो कहने का मतलब है कि ये इतनी नई नई चीजें इन्होंने किया है इसके बाद अद्वैत मुक्तिवाद का सामाजिक विनियोग विज्ञान दर्शन और अद्वैत ये इतना महत्वपूर्ण टॉपिक है कोई भी प्रथम दृष्टिया देख करके अद्वैत वेदांत का विज्ञान से क्या बता वही विज्ञान जो विज्ञान हम सब सामान्य विज्ञान की बात करते हैं तो ये सब चीजें हैं इनकी क्योंकि मुझे समय उधार में मिला है इसलिए मैं ज्यादा नहीं कहूँ थोड़े मैं बोल दू उसमें मैं आहार ज्ञान की बात करूंगा थोड़ा सा थोड़ा सा अद्वैतवाद और विज्ञान विज्ञान दर्शन आहार ज्ञान सब अद्वैत ज्ञान या अद्वैत ज्ञान सम्यक ज्ञान सम्यक दर्शन या संसन है जो समस्त भेद ज्ञान या द्वैत ज्ञान की पृष्ठभूमि में विद्यमान रहता है मैं थोड़ी सी अपनी बात कहूंगा बाद में भेद ज्ञान में अद्वैत ज्ञान का आवर्तन विवर्तन होता है दूसरे शब्दों में भेद ज्ञान अभेद ज्ञान से व्याप्त है उसमें इंक्लूडेड है ये नहीं कि अभेद है तो उसमें भेद नहीं है क्योंकि थ्रू भेद ही तो अभेद की स्थापना होती है 
तथा भेद या द्वैत अभेद मूलक है गौर पात उन्होंने कोट किया है उन्होंने जो कहते हैं अद्वैतम परमार्थो हित भेद उच्चते अर्थात अद्वैत परमार्थिक है और द्वैत उसका भेद या प्रकार है इस दृष्टि से अद्वैत दर्शन सभी प्रकार के द्वैत दर्शन से अविरुद्ध है कोई विरोध नहीं है अविरुद्ध शब्द का प्रयोग किया उन्होंने क्योंकि उनके अंत विरोधों का निराकरण करने वाला अद्वैत सिद्धांत ही है अभी कोई बात आ रही थी कि अद्वैत में भी कोई विरोध असर ने कहा था किसी ने बात हुई थी भी तो सामान्यता देखने लगता है कोई विरोध नहीं है लेकिन उसी में भेद समाहित है समस्त विज्ञान विषय ज्ञान अध्यास नहीं है कुछ विषय ज्ञान से ज्ञान ऐच्छिक है जबकि अध्यास ज्ञान अनैच्छिक और नैसर्गिक है ऐसे ऐच्छिक ज्ञान को आहार ज्ञान पांडे जी कहते प्रसाद पांडे जी जब बात आती है अद्वैत वेदान की आप सभी जानते हैं वो सामान से भी सामान विद्यार्थी भी कहेगा कि भाई मोक्ष का ज्ञान आधार है उसे भक्ति का कोई मतलब नहीं इस आहार ज्ञान को प्रतिपादित करने का उनका उद्देश्य था कि अद्वैत में भी भक्ति है जिसको उन्होंने कहा ऐच्छिक अद्वैत मैं जो समझता हूं इन्होंने उस बहुत मतलब विक्षेप की है कि दो चीजें हमारे मतलब एस्पेक्ट हमारे व्यक्तित्व के हैं भावना और बुद्धि जो भावना है इसमें इन्होंने बाद में लिखते भी है कि समस्त विज्ञान विषय ज्ञान अध्यास नहीं है कुछ विषय ज्ञान ऐच्छिक और जब कि अध्यास ज्ञान अनैच्छिक और नैसर्गिक है ऐसे ऐच्छिक ज्ञान को आहार ज्ञान प्रसाण करते प्रसाण ने उदाहरण देते हैं ब्रह्म ज्ञान के अनंतर भक्ति ज्ञान संभव है जिसको हम ज्ञान के द्वारा जानते हैं या नहीं है इसका उत्तर देते हैं कि भक्ति ज्ञान आहार ज्ञान है जो कर्ता की इच्छा से किसी प्रयोजन के लिए किया जाता है यानी क्या समय हो गया क्या अच्छा अच्छा बस 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 हम सोचे कि हम बहुत कम बोल रहे हैं <coughs> तो मतलब ये कहने का कि हम अद्वैत वेदांत की जब बात करते हैं सिद्धांतता तो हम मानते हैं कि ज्ञानी उसका आधार है लेकिन कहीं ना कहीं संवेदना में हमारी चेतना में भक्ति आती है जिसका हम वर्ण सिद्धांत रूप से हम नहीं मानते कबीर को मैं लेना चाहूंगा फिर समाप्त करूंगा कबीर जब कहते हैं कि जब निर्गुण भक्ति की बात वो करते हैं तो आप सभी जानते हैं बहुत बताने की जरूरत नहीं है मेरा घर मंगलाचार मेरे घर आम राम भरतार मैं कहता हूं कि मैं जो समझता हूं इसके आधार पर राम शब्द का जो प्रयोग होता है वहां भी आहार ज्ञान की व्यवस्था है यद्यपि वह निर्गुण की बात का सिद्धांतता और निर्गुण भक्ति है वो लेकिन राम कहाँ से आते हैं राम कहाँ से आते हैं राधा स्वामी संप्रदाय वालों से मैंने एक बार पूछा भाई ये राधा स्वामी नाम कहां से कोई राधा कृष्ण का कहने नहीं उससे कोई मतलब नहीं मैंने केवल ये पूछा मैं जाना तो राधा स्वामी नाम आया कहां से आपके संप्रदाय का तो मैं मानता हूं ये सारे जो उदाहरण हैं निर्गुण भक्ति के हो सकते हैं निर्गुण ज्ञान के हो सकते हैं लेकिन उसके मूल में संवेदना के स्तर पर हम भक्त से जुड़ जाते हैं आहार ज्ञान वास्तव में वही एक सिद्धांत है इसमें बहुत सी चीजें हम ज्यादा नहीं बोलूंगा और बस एक लास्ट का करके सर बस अद्वैत विज्ञान और दर्शन यह भी उनकी नई चीज है सामान्यतः हम देखते हैं अद्वैत दर्शन कहीं है मूल बात और जब वो परिभाषा स्वरूप लक्षण और जब ब्रह्म की लक्षण की बात करते हैं स्वरूप लक्षण और तथस्थ लक्षण अच्छा बस बस यही बोलकर खत्म कर रहे हैं तो उसमें जो आपका स्वरूप लक्षण है उसको मानते हैं प्रसाद पांडे जी वह अद्वैत अद्वैतिक मेटाफिजिक्स है जो तटस्थ है आप भी समझ रहे हैं वह अद्वैतिक फिलोसफी ऑफ साइंस है ये तमाम चीजें हैं इसमें और उनका समन्वय करते हैं अब मैं छोड़ता हूं क्योंकि तो जैसे गड़बड़ हो जाएगा और मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूं पूरे सबको और प्रसाद आनंद मिश्र जी को हमको एडजस्ट किया हमको छुट्टी मिल जाएगी बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आप सबको थैंक यू सो मच सर नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट नीति जी प्लीज कम गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑफ यू अलॉट हैज ऑलरेडी बीन सेड अबाउट द फिलोसफी ऑफ प्रोफेसर संगम लाल पांडे जी सो आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू से मच आई स्कीप 
most of the parts of my uh, presentation or a such paper so i'm directly coming on some some of the very important points so epistemology basically according to professor pandey can be understood in two ways surface and depth the former proposes that knowledge is object subject relation means this is the uh, stand of surface ep epistemology it is of two types objective and subjective the discussion of objective knowledge that is vishayagat gyan is theoretic or related to the objects it means prameya mulak and subjective knowledge atmanishta gyan is intrinsic or intuitive antahakaran mulak according to professor pandey nyaya philosophy is an ideal example of surface epistemology and in western philosophy empiricism rationalism and others are also surface epistemology uh, epistemologies because according to them the level is the same for all the meanings according to deep epistemology there are some meanings whose levels are higher and deeper than the levels of other meanings that is the essence of deep epistemology for example in the criticism described by kant that is alochanavad there are three successive deeper levels of knowledge which is called the synthesis of space time and the transcendental unity of uh, self knowledge in kant's philosophy at least the level of the transcendental unity of self knowledge is deeper than other objects and matters and according to surface epistemology neither the knowledge of the soul nor of the thing in itself is possible when atman is taken as a different entity from mind and intellect it is very obvious it becomes unknowable along with the subjectivity in the upanishad uh, that's the point of advaitin thinkers it was told through the four words such as tatvam asi etadvaitat etc that the soul is knowable all knowledge is idam parak just as ayam ghatah ayam patah etc are the idam parak gyan similarly all knowledge is idam parak means this is that this and that both are the same element and the experience of this element is the subject of deep philosophy for this shravan manan nididhyasan and self realization that is aparokshanubhuti are suggested which is called the path of knowledge the surface epistemology culminates in agnosticism as professor jata shankar tiwari my teacher has already suggested so knowledge is deep and immense there is no end to it that's why wise people say that more they know the less they actually know and the more a person dives into the ocean of knowledge the more elemental gems he gets professor sangam lal pandey named his philosophy as depth epistemology under which a special importance was given to intuitive knowledge pratyabh gyan and till then no knowledge could be accepted unless it is supported by intuitive knowledge in deep epistemology there is no place for improbability probability possibility doubt antithesis etc rather faith devotion vision self realization indirect experience bliss aesthetic experiences values etc are the areas of depth epistemology professor sangam lal pandey after a detailed study of all the theories of knowledge claims that no theory is satisfactory enough to give us a complete understanding of knowledge the question raised by professor pandey is is there only that much knowledge as much human knows are there no other possibilities in our knowledge apart from the experiential and transcendental or intellectual aspects he says this is true that the transcendental aspect is the foundation stone and the prerequisite of the empirical aspect but in the name of rationality eliminating the possibility of intuition or insight seems dogmatic this is the reason why he named this type of epistemology surface epistemology professor pandey makes a clear distinction between depth epistemology and surface epistemology he uses the term depth epistemology for the epistemology that is the foundation of all human experience or in other words this knowledge is the exploration of extra sensory perception whereas surface epistemology is concerned with the source of knowledge western rationalism empiricism criticism realism idealism and pragmatism etc are kinds of surface epistemology because they offer only an empirical explanation of the knowledge process professor pandey's intensive epistemological approaches based on the two level theory of knowledge go to say the second order uh, Uh, inquiry we can divide our cognitive achievements into objective and subjective perceptual uh, empirical evidence can be placed under objective knowledge which is the domain of our common experience or the interpersonal world 
this is surface epistemology professor pandey places subjective knowledge under deep epistemology by which he intends discursive intuition vimarshatmak antar bodh counter cognition pratibodh viditam or self awareness atma samvitti hence in the lahabal school of philosophy it has been designated from different terms but their general consensus is based on the premise that the soul and its knowledge cannot be placed in the domain of samuel alexander's democracy of ideas where all views share an affiliation and enjoy the same level according to professor mukherjee to accept all concepts and ideas are equal is to suffer from the defect of transcendental dislocation we have already heard about it and professor pandey imbibes this point of view and proposes the division of shesh and ashesh pramanas by the shesh pramana simply he means the empirical proofs and its incompleteness six proofs accepted by indian philosophers have been called the shesh or apurna pramanas they are formulated under sub- surface epistemology by ashesh pramanas he means self realization that is aparokshanubhuti based on non directive experience they also express the residual proof with full proof because this is the same pure perception in whose a uh, prerequisite and by which all the proof theoretical behavior results in the indian philosophical tradition such as stratification of pramanas is also available in the past as in the definition of vedanta there is a clear division between tattva vedak and atattva vedak pramanas professor pandey considers this self knowledge as the subject of depth epistemology lakshana mimamsa is an important point, uh, point in professor pandey's deep epistemological point of view because it is not only the predecessor of epistemology but also the fundamental concept the definition is the structural condition of object realization whereas praman it uh, is its epistemological condition and on this basis definition and praman are related to depth and surface epistemology respectively they propose it in the context of indian epistemology and in the context of wittgenstein's criteriology generally the purpose of a definition that is lakshan is considered to be attitude and behavior but on the basis of this purpose it does not seem appropriate to conceive of lakshan mimamsa as the basic concept of praman mimamsa the whole effort of conceptualization of the proofs does not presuppose their possible characteristics it is based on how is our metaphysics what is our fundamental pre recognition of reality it, if someone asks whether the discussion of epistemology is possible in the absence of metaphysics then we would say according to professor pandey that the search for logic and proofs is futile in a world devoid of existence the focal point of depth epistemology i'm just concluding is the interrelationship between bhasha darshan the philosophy of language and pramana mimamsa epistemology in the context of lakshan mimamsa the most important dimension of professor pandey's deep epistemology is self centered metaphysics that is atma kendrit tattva mimamsa so uh, i just want to conclude in further points that the the main important thing which is the the center of this deep or depth epistemology is criterion the what is the criterion professor pandey has not explained the criterion in detail but it has been adequately discussed in the essays which have been compiled in problems of depth epistemology and criterion is used in epistemology as a principle by which the relative value of things can be determined it is expressed that every intelligent being has the discretion to separate the truth from the untruth the good from the bad and the right from the wrong criterion can be called the philosophical tool of deep epistemology so the criterion is the culmination of the development of definition and since criterion is a philosophical tool for the search for definition and meaning and for their observation and testing etc therefore it is justified to consider the criterion higher than both definition and proposition thank you so much thank you dr niti now i would like to invite uh, professor uh, sir professor dk mohanta for presidential remark please come sir i am uh, sorry because lunch is getting late by 45 minutes and it is not wise to teach philosophy especially metaphysics we are hungry person <laughs> we started with you know very viable alabad school of philosophy i also include kasi bhattacharji in the same line when rabe presented in such a manner the freedom of idea you know 
Krasi Patajaji was very much afraid of this privilege. Uh, another caste, English speaking people or English educated people in those days. Today, even we know in, in we meet in many interview boards, if some one candidate speaks in English, replies in good English, most of the I found among my friends think that perhaps he or she is the best scholar. I said, no, I beg to differ. <laughs> So uh, we should not have any kind of privilege. And this does the emphasized in the freedom of ideas. Started with Professor Jatasankarji, my whom I call my elder brother, and both of us are fond of Sanskrit. He has shown in a drop of water the whole ocean. He analyzed in such a way. But one thing is that Purana Mittivam na sadhu sarvam. So there is also variation, deviations in the traditions. And all these four speakers have shown us in enough with enough logic that there is also deviations. How? Then contextualizing the traditions. If we cannot contextualize the tradition, then it will be just a kind of orthodoxy, as said by Professor Kalidas Bhattacharya, the son of K.C. Bhattacharya. Orthodoxy is not good. It is a mere repetition of the past. In that way, we shall exercise only philosophy as a dead subject. And nobody will turn towards philosopher for inspirations. But I am very happy to see in this special session, uh, dominated by Rawa, the school of philosophy, there is a living tradition. <laughs> you know, we are, uh, to use a word from Heidegger, it is a kind of exercise in distancing nearness. So we are distancing with the past, and by this way, we are getting closer to the past. So I, I thank profusely. My language fails, rather, to express my gratitude to this department under the leadership of my friend, Professor Anand Misraji, that it is philosophy is a viable subject in India. And he started this program and continuing this. We all are here to help these traditions. And this session is very viable. I thank all the speakers from the core of my heart. Also, I'm very sorry I could not allow last two for to last two uh, uh, papers. And there are many queries we know among ourselves. But philosopher's job is not to give answer, but to raise questions. I, in your mind, you'll exercise this. <laughs> and I think. Your food is getting cold. Better you attend your lunch. Thank you so much. Now start. Next session. Next session.